So thanks for everybody coming out. Uh, we appreciate you being here for the first Arduino day. Um, we're making it up as we go along too, so relax and enjoy it. Um, we planned a couple of talks today uh, throughout the day in addition to the various demos and so forth. And I asked Nick Buhlman to, to kick it off because he is always fantastic at both presenting his work and making other wonderful work. Nick um, is an independent musician here in New York who uh, is also an alum of ITP, also a faculty member of ITP, and has been making some really wonderful uh, acoustic musical instruments with Arduino for quite a while. Um, which you can see downstairs after his talk if you're interested as well. <coughs> Take it away, Nick. All right. Really, really pleased to be here to celebrate Arduino. Um, as Tom said, I'm Nick Yulman, and I'm going to be talking about um, a lot of the work I do with kind of musical robotics involving Arduino, and particularly a platform that I've been developing over the last couple of years called Bricolo, um, which is sort of a way to open up um, mechanical music and kind of acoustic instruments controlled at the computer to a whole range of digital musicians. Um, so here is um, sort of what a kit that I've been putting together looks like, um, several modules, which I'll get into in a little bit more detail later. But the basic idea is that if you're making music with a computer, so if you're working with a sequencer, as you know, most musicians are at this point, whether it's Ableton Live or Pro Tools or Cubase, um, and you are tired of only kind of having your output be something that lives within your computer, so synthesizers, samplers, drum machines, um, this is a way to use that same sort of precision, that same sort of ease of programming but have it actually be realized in the physical world. So taking the same MIDI signals that a synthesizer or sampler would use, and then actually being able to control physical objects, whether they're acoustic instruments or any sound that you want. Um, so um, as Tom mentioned, I've been doing kind of this work for, for a number of years myself um, as an installation artist. Um, so I do what I call song installations, which are an arrangement of robotic instruments um, that I write music for. Um, and then it's usually something that I kind of spread out throughout a space and really encourage listeners to sort of sit within, within the arrangement of music and kind of explore how a song is put together acoustically. So I'll just show you an example of the most recent one of these I did. This was from last summer um, at a museum in Paris called the Palais de Tokyo, um, which is a, a big art center there. Um, and this is a big collaborative project with a number of, um, number of other artists, including um, a group called Rabbit Hands, which does these wonderful installations with scavenged materials. And so the structure that this is all situated in is all built from scavenged materials by this other group of artists. Um, here's a video. So that's just a little taste. Um, so that was, um, as I mentioned, kind of a large scale installation um, that I worked with a group of other artists with. And it was called Concert Hall. And it was a cycle of about a dozen songs, some that I wrote and some that were written by a wonderful French musician named Julien Gasque, who's collaborated with Stereo Lab as well as others. Um, and so it's sort of this, this robotic concert with no actual human presence, just these sort of disembodied voices floating in. Um, and accompanied by these robotic instruments so people could kind of explore and really be within the music. Um, and so um, I've also used these robotic instruments for live performances sort of as a backing band and have recorded um, some albums with them as well. Um, 
And, and like I said, I, I really came to this because I had been making music with computers for quite a while and really loved the precision and control that you have with a digital production platform. So it's amazing. Um, you can kind of create all these layers and multi-track, very complex arrangements. Um, but then when it comes time to actually present that work publicly beyond a recording, um, there's a frustration that I think a lot of people have with having to just do this. So this is Girl Talk, you know, putting in a, a very vigorous performance, obviously, but still sort of just trapped behind a laptop. Um, and there's not really much transparency as to what's going on with the music itself. Um, and so, you know, I was interested in figuring out a way to kind of make the music more visceral, but still be ha having that digital control and really get back to sort of this feeling. Um, so this is example of 19th century parlor music, which was really, you know, before recorded music, um, chances are your experience of music was sitting around in a small space with friends or family and playing instruments. And, and of course, mechanical music also played into this scenario as well. So as player pianos became popular, um, that might be your home entertainment system as well. So I was interested in sort of extending that legacy of, of mechanical music and making installations that really invited people to have a very intimate and kind of immediate experience with the music being played around them. Um, so here's just another example of an installation that I've done that, that, that you know, tried to evoke that. So this, again, is sort of a series of instruments and a, a song cycle that I wrote played among them. And people could really kind of wa wander through and, and hear the different sounds and have the sounds be very spatialized within their own space. Um, and I also sometimes use these setups to do interactive works. So often with a simpler music program. And this is actually a piece that I have set up downstairs, so if you want to come play with it. But I'll just show a brief demo. So this is a piece called Animal Magnetizer, which also uses a connect for some spatial sensing so that as viewers um, hover their hands over each of these sort of instruments that, that has these mechanical modules on them, they're triggering them. And it's a kind of inviting people to collaboratively mix a song. So loops that are all playing in sync, but you're sort of activating them and just um, giving voice to each of these instruments. Yeah, so, so as I said, it, it's partially a way to kind of give people who you know, don't necessarily have experience playing music sort of an opportunity to get inside and mix the sound and also to collaborate with each other. So as, as the instruments are spread across the space, you really need several people to activate everything. So it becomes kind of a fun interactive experience. Um, so I'll just go through a few build photos. Um, so this was um, you know, an early prototype of the MIDI hardware um, in a Tupperware container, as, as we all like to do. Um, you can see there's Arduino, plenty of Arduino involved in this project. Um, so basically, this, this is um, just taking input, a MIDI input from the computer or whatever other sequencing um, hardware you want to use. And then it's just routing out, um, for each MIDI note, um, it's routing out um, DC current. I use typically 24 volts um, to one of the solenoids that's um, attached to the actu actuator modules. Um, so you have a control box where you can map MIDI notes to specific instruments. Um, and then this is the, the current build for the circuit board um, that I designed. But it's still essentially an Arduino embedded in the, in the board there. Um, and fans of OSH Park will recognize the distinctive purple and gold um, board there. Um, and then, as I said, this is sort of the control box. So here is the routing system. So it's just using RCHX. And you know, really, the goal of this is to develop a system that um, I have several modules I've developed. But if you are, would rather build your own pieces, um, it's very easy to connect everything up. So it's just sending, as I said, 24 volts out through these RCA connectors to these modules. Um, and this is what the current sort of basic set that I've been putting together. And um, you know, I've, I've been able to offer this in a limited way to other musicians who are interested. So um, really, an international group of musicians um, from Australia to Sweden um, to Germany have, have bought these sets and are kind of now using them in their own work. And I'm very, very excited to see 
um, what, what, what they wind up doing with it. And I'm really working towards making this more and more available to people. Um, so the, the basic modules that are in the current set are um, this, which is a fairly self-explanatory, a drumstick that mounts onto a microphone stand. So it's very easy to position over a drum or whatever else you want. Um, and then this module, which I call a surface popper, which is a smaller solenoid, a smaller actuator that sits on this little platform. Um, and it's whatever surface is placed on there, so whether it's a drum or, in this case, a book, um, becomes the sound source. So this um, little solenoid plunger just pops up to strike it. Um, and so I use these for percussion sounds, a lot of the kind of high-pitched um, sounds that you heard in those installations, including those that were hanging from the ceiling in that, that first installation. But I also have been using it um, for something I call the thing synth, which is a way of actually generating um, tuned notes from physical objects. So basically a synthesizer that plays things, physical objects. Um, and that's, that's using this same module. But um, in that case, the control hardware, instead of just sending a single pulse for each MIDI note, it's actually very rapidly pulsing that actuator um, at the appropriate frequency for whatever MIDI note is coming into it. So I'll have a, just a quick demo video that shows that here. The Thing Synth module goes beyond percussion sounds and lets you play melodies and bass lines on physical objects. Changing the properties of an object is like dialing in new settings on a filter. All right, that's enough. Um, so yeah, uh, so this is a really fun one. And, and I've found books are particularly lovely to use with this because they have this sort of built-in um, you know, variable volume. So it really is, does sound something like sweeping a resonant filter on a Moog or something like that. Um, and, and you know, in general, uh, as Tom mentioned, um, so I teach a class here at ITP, which is about automation and kind of using it for creative purposes. And in general, one of the things I encourage people to explore is using MIDI or using OSC or these other um, systems that have very easy to use, sophisticated software for creating complex sequences um, to control whatever it is you want to control. So, I mean, I'm using this for an explicitly musical purpose, but you can just as easily use Ableton Live or any other um, MIDI sequencer to control really anything that you want to control with an Arduino. So, this is just a, a quick example video that I put together showing um, using MIDI to control, um, still a musical instrument in my case, but um, instead of strikes of a solenoid, um, the sweep of servos. So using, in this case, um, so just to, to briefly get into it, typically a MIDI message has two bytes that you're sending to it. So it's a note message that's saying, turn this note on or off, um, and then a velocity message, which more or less corresponds to the, the volume level. Um, but in this case, I'm using the velocity note. So basically just another chunk of data that you can use for anything you want to control the angle of two servos that are on a little pan tilt head. So here's example of that. So as I said, again, I'm using it for musical purposes, as is my want. But, but you can imagine you know, if you've built this robot or this robot arm, and you're having trouble doing all the complex timing programming that, that you know, is available on Arduino, but it does, does get kind of gnarly. Hooking it up to MIDI and being able to control it with a really easy to use interface like Ableton or any other sequencer is a really convenient and nice kind of thing to be able to do. Um, and this is also great if you're trying to sync any of your creations with music or lights or whatever else it is. So it's uh, something to explore and encourage you to uh, check it out. I, and I do have some tutorials um, on the uh, page that I have set up for, for the class that I teach if you're interested in looking at uh, more of those examples. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And also, as, I, as Tom said, I've got a setup demoing some of this stuff downstairs. So come by and check that out later. Right, so, um, so that was actually using a Kinect. Um, so there was a Kinect positioned in the back of the room and basically drawing in little target areas above each of those instruments. And so that's, that's uh, using software 
um, I wrote in processing, and then that's sending MIDI messages from processing to Ableton to trigger different um, tracks on and off um, with a loop that's kind of constantly going. So Ableton was your uh, MIDI program that you used on your laptop then? Yes. Okay. So then how did that translate into 24 volt signals? Right, so um, that's basically what um, these control boxes, so that's what those are doing. So this is a, a MIDI jack here, um, kind of standard. And you can do MIDI, um, there's, there's um, a MIDI in circuit that's documented everywhere on the web um, that you can use to with more standard MIDI hardware. But there's also plenty of, if you just want to use direct serial um, from your computer to Arduino, there's plenty of kind of MIDI interpreter um, programs that very, very easily uh, interpret that and kind of send it off as MIDI, MIDI notes. Um, so it's basically MIDI in, I'm um, going to there, and then um, 24 volts going into this, and then that's being routed out from these connections. All right. Thanks, everyone.
Um, so, uh, for our second talk of the day, uh, we have Nick Yulman again, in a new disguise this time, as, as an employee of Kickstarter with uh, Julio Terra. Um, those of you who don't know Kickstarter, it's a, anybody not know Kickstarter in the room? Good. Okay. So, um, Kickstarter has, has uh, been a great source of uh, really interesting Arduino-based or Arduino-derived or Arduino-inspired projects. And we've had a lot of conversations back and forth with Nick and Julio and John D'Amato's of the product team about how we feed into their ecosystem and vice versa. Um, and, and they've done some really great thinking about it. So we thought we'd just open up a general community discussion around it and uh, let them take it away. So thank you guys for coming up. Thanks, Tom. Hey, everybody. I'm Julio. I mean, and you guys have already been introduced to Nick. Um, so, both me and Nick, uh, along with John, we are, our, our title today is product specialist. By next week, we're going to be called community managers, but we're essentially you know, responsible for working with creators and uh, looking at projects, both in the product design as well as in the technology parts of the Kickstarter ecosystem. And um, on a personal level, uh, all three of us have uh, you know, studied at ITP, and we all work with Tom very closely, and we're all big fans of Arduinos. We all have our own Arduino projects and um, prototypes that we do. So, so it's I think Arduino, the Arduino community specifically, is very close to us, uh, and it's very kind of something very important to us on a on a personal as well as kind of on a, on a in terms of what we like to see on, on Kickstarter. And I think it's also just you know the ethos around technology that Arduino represents is exactly what we want to see on Kickstarter. Like openness, really inviting <coughs> people to take part in the creation of something really cool and really exciting. Um, Absolutely. Um, so, but just a few numbers uh, about Kickstarter to start off with. You know, just a few weeks ago, we actually reached our one billion dollar pledge. So that means that uh, we launched about five years ago, and in, in this five year period. Uh, we've had people uh, pledge over a billion dollars to projects. 80% of those projects, uh, a little bit over 80% of those projects were successful. Uh, or sorry, a little percent of 80% of this money was pledged to successful projects. Actually about 44% of projects on our site actually succeed. Um, that means you know this number was a billion uh, dollars uh, was pledged to you know thousands and thousands of projects, somewhere around you know 70,000 projects, around 58,000 of which was actually Products that were successfully funded, and um, you know, and these products, of course, span uh, everything from music to theater uh, to art, film, uh, technology, dance, comics, publishing. So it's really kind of a really wide range of, of stuff. I mean, here today we're going to, of course, focus on specifically not even just technology, but specifically the Arduino community on Kickstarter. So. Um, Arduino projects on Kickstarter specifically, these are kind of some facts and figures about uh, that specific community. 62% uh, of Arduino projects on our site, and, and of course, um, this analysis probably, you know, is not every single Arduino project that's ever been on the site. We just kind of did our best to kind of do some, some research and pull some data. Uh, but Arduino projects on our site are pretty high, they have a pretty high rate of success. 62% of those projects are successful compared to our site's average of 44%. And what that just goes to sh show is that there is you know, a really kind of vibrant community of people who are Arduino fans and who are looking for Arduino projects on Kickstarter. And, um, you know, and I think that's something that we kind of see not only through this number as well, but, but just you, you definitely see a lot of those projects that are related to our Arduino have a lot of, you know, kind of comments on the projects. Uh, there's a lot of buzz around them um, because it is, again, just a, a, you know, a community where there's a lot of people uh, on Kickstarter who are kind of ha always have their eyes open for those types of projects. And, and as Julio said, so this is just a representation of projects that either in their name or in their kind of short description reference Arduino. There are hundreds more that use Arduino in some way. So whether for prototyping or there's an Arduino that's running um, all the magic that's happening with the product. Um, so this is most likely just, just things that are specifically kind of Arduino accessories and things that are for the Arduino community itself. But Arduino has a much larger footprint than just this on Kickstarter as well. Yeah, and, and so the types of Arduino products that we see on Kickstarter, there's a few different kinds. There are some projects that are just literally products that at one point in their life, they were using an Arduino to prototype some type of hardware. So that final hardware, that they're, their final product that they're releasing to the market may not have an Arduino in it, but it was, you know, when you look at their, the, the prototyping process, 
they show pictures of you know working prototypes or previous prototypes that featured some type of Arduino uh, in that product. Some of those that's the kind of product that's least represented in these numbers because those don't always kind of tout that very strongly. Um, and then we have projects like Arduino Shield projects and Arduino accessory projects. So there's a lot of people who will create, you know, I mean, anyone who's uh, you know familiar working with, with Arduinos, you know that Shields is a kind of an awesome you know, add-on to help you prototype stuff. But then we also have some people that actually use Kickstarter to create sensors that are, you know, were specifically designed to be used with platforms like an Arduino. And then, of course, you have projects which are the Arduino compatible projects uh, or Arduino R projects where people are actually developing a project that, you know, um, has, you know, that functions, that, that, you know, provides some types of functionality that are mimicking an Arduino, or some of them will use the same hardware as an Arduino, same chip as an Arduino, so that they're programmable using their Arduino IDE. Um, and that's kind of, you know, I think, the three main different uh, categories of Arduino projects that you see um, on Kickstarter. So just a few, you know, some additional data about like the, the health of the community. Um, what you can see is, is, you know, there's been, you know, almost seven uh, million dollars pledged to projects that again explicitly mention their um, relationship to Arduino, either in their title of their project or in their short blurb about the project. Um, as you can see, kind of just looking at the graph, I mean the number of projects related, like from this community, has you know increased a lot in the last couple of years. I mean I think that trend does show that's pretty much you'd see something like that across the board on our site. I mean last year, out of the one billion dollars that were have been pledged to Kickstarter, five hundred. A uh, million of that was pledged last year, so you know that's why you you do see this kind of huge spike last year. That's something that you would pretty see across most um, categories. But again, the, the the thing that we're trying to show here is just how you know this community is growing. And uh, in 2014, you know, right now, if you look at that, it looks like it's less than 2013. But that's only because the spike when we actually get. Uh, you know, the most projects is around the summer, so we'd expect to see a spike again this year, you know, of Arduino-related projects that's considerably larger uh, than what we saw last year. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all the other numbers on this page, but it's just kind of that, that idea that, uh, again, it's a really, very vibrant ecosystem. Um, now we're going to just kind of jump through some examples of projects that kind of have come. Uh, we're, this is some of the projects that we uh, personally like that we think it kind of shows um, you know, just kind of some, some creators that have used Kickstarter to bring fun Arduino projects uh, to life um, using our platform, and and you know, it's 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 we clearly see that there's um, you know, like with any platform, like we we at Kickstarter, we don't curate projects. We have some guidelines, and and you know, projects uh, that they meet that guideline, whether we like it or like the project or not, uh, they are allowed to run uh, on the site because it's I mean, our whole idea is that we don't. We're, we're creating this platform for, for you know, the backers of the side where it really comes to life and we're not kind of the gatekeepers. But at the same time, you know, I think all of us on the team, we definitely have projects that we personally like and you know, we personally um, will promote um, and, and talk about with our friends and with our communities. And these are ones that you know, I think most of these either you know, Nick, me, or John have backed. Um, so uh, this is one that I backed. You know, this is, um, the, uh, one of the things that we like about this project is this is a pretty small project. You know, it was something where where you know their their goal was ten thousand dollars. I mean, this is not. I mean, we do have a lot of our bigger projects where they they are really making a small, tiny board where they're pla where they're looking for two, three thousand dollars. But this is on the smaller end of the, of the kind of projects in the Arduino ecosystem. But it was just a really nice um, little shield that lets you create. Um, you know, it was designed for you to do little graphic stuff, either do like video game type stuff or do these kind of you know. Um, these type of playing around with photos, uh, when you kind of do that kind of, I forgot what you call the, the these photos, long exposure photos, where you just kind of move the LED um, device around and it creates these this kind of text or what? Light painting. Yeah, light painting, exactly. Um, and so this is one that I backed and I just got it recently. I haven't actually, I literally got it this week. I haven't actually put it together yet, which I, I have to say that there I have several Arduino projects that I have at home that are shields that I haven't actually put together yet. I have a little stack of them, but um, which is one of the, the, the kind of issues working at Kickstarter. A lot of your salary goes back into Kickstarter projects. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at them all day long. So, um, 
This is another project that um, I also backed and I haven't received yet, but it's the One Shield. And this was a really kind of interesting project. It's, it's a little bit, you know, uh, more complex than the one than the Digi Shield, um, the Digi Pixel. It actually uh, is a shield that lets you connect to your phone. So rather than say if you needed to prototype something, rather than buy a bunch of sensors, a bunch of switches, you can actually, you know, use your phone as a, uh, and, and kind of tap into like the accelerometer on your phone. Use your phone as a switch or as multiple switches. Uh, it's essentially. You know the combination of a shield with low uh, with with PLE uh, with Bluetooth low energy and with you know a few phone apps that they create for you that lets you tap into those features of your phone and um, you know it, it is it's one of those ideas where when I, when I first heard about it I thought it was silly but the more I thought about it the more I kind of liked it um, just because I know how many how I have an absurd box full of sensors at my house that I don't often use and uh, you know I always have my phone with me wherever I am and, and this just kind of makes it easy for you to prototype stuff really quickly um, in a really fun way and also it was just cool because this, this was like a hacker space out of Cairo that was actually making these so it was just kind of also it was coming from uh, a, a Arduino community that you know in a part of the world that we hadn't really kind of seen be actively engaged on, on, on Kickstarter before but um, so this one here is, is actually a really, really awesome little project as well. It was called the Micro Slice, and, um, and what this is, it's uh, just a very small little laser cutter slash engraver that has an Arduino inside that kind of does all the, you know, that's, that kind of runs the machine. And um, yeah, and it's just, I mean, it's only powerful enough to cut paper. Uh, other than paper, it can, you know, if it's anything any, any thicker than that, it just can engrave it. But uh, and it's all done with uh, you know little laser cut parts. Uh, it was only a couple hundred dollars, you know, or, or actually about I think 200 pounds, so that's I guess 300 bucks or so. Uh, but again, it was a really kind of nice uh, little project where you know just a, a maker in in England um, put this together, and um, so. Uh, and this kind of gets to the other types of projects, which again, is no longer the two first were kind of shield projects. This is one of those projects which, which is actually a product that has an Arduino and it's hackable because yeah. of that. Yeah, you can, you can maybe see, it's actually behind Julio, but there's you know, an actually uh, official Arduino sitting there running the whole thing. It's really cool. Yeah, so this is a, a big one, uh, the Makey Makey, which is a very cool, um, prototyping platform, but really also a way, sort of, uh, in introduction to microcontrollers and Arduinos for people who maybe haven't gotten into programming or haven't done this before. So, it's essentially a board that has a lot of really convenient to use capacitive sensors. So you can clip these alligator clips on each of these and attach them to things like bananas. And um, you know, basically, what it's doing is sending key commands from the microcontroller, the Arduino-based microcontroller that's on the board, so that you can hook it up to any website that accepts various key commands to control things, or any very simple program that's already set up to do that. It also is, um, you know, there, the hardware on it is a full Arduino, so that if you get kind of beyond that point and you want to start programming it yourself and using those sensors that are built into it as an interface, it has an option to kind of extend your learning curve there. This has been tremendously popular. Like, I mean, just two, two points. I, I actually, it's, it's not a capacitive sensor. It's a um, high resistance switch. So oh, you yeah, actually yeah. have to touch two things uh, in order for it to work. But, it, it, but essentially, yeah, yeah. It's, and then the other thing, I know that this is um, the processor on here is, is, a, is one of the things that we do, you know, Call these project this type of project we call it Arduino compatible because it's it's you know it was prototyped on Arduino but you know it is actually a project where um, the board it can be programmed using the Arduino IDE but it, it's not like it has not been kind of tested rigorously to make sure that it kind of works with all the different you know Arduino libraries that it works with all the Arduino examples which I think is it's just one of those things where um, you know, we, we are working harder and harder with, with our community to make sure that you know, they, they are technically accurate about like, how these different um, creations actually you know, work with the Arduino ecosystem. Because you know, we know that nowadays, I think there's, there's a lot of expectations about what, what an Arduino can do uh, and what an Arduino um, is, you know, it supports. And I think you know, outside of, of, of boards that kind of have been tested to kind of work with the full kind of spectrum of, of Arduino libraries and whatnot. Um, you know, these other kind of products we, we, we work with the creators to just always make sure that it's technically accurate, like how they 
um, their project actually kind of works in the ecosystem. <coughs> Um, so this is sort of the opposite end of that spectrum. So from the kind of very beginnings of somebody getting into making things to um, sending something actually into space. Um, so this is a satellite that's based on Arduino. Um, and what this project did was essentially allowed people to um, gain access to these very small um, 10 centimeter cubed um, satellites with this package of sensors attached to the Arduino. And for a pledge, um, you could get access to that, that satellite that was out in space. They, they actually launched a, a number of these and run your experiment, uh, kind of upload your Arduino code and run your experiment for a set amount of time. So essentially, have access to an Arduino that they've sent off into space with a sensor package. Um, and here's actual image of the ArduSats floating in space. Um, and you can see this is one of the reward tiers. So for $300, you had three days worth of uptime with the satellite to run your Arduino program and do experiments and then get all the data back for whatever purposes you want. Um, it had cameras integrated with it so you could take footage and um, a various, various array of sensors. Um, this is another super, super cool one. Um, and this is part of the, the Arduino at Heart program, um, which is you know sort of the more officially endorsed and kind of projects that are working directly with Arduino to make sure that their standards are compatible with, with Arduinos. Um, and so this is um, a very tiny Arduino right here with a very small OLED um, display there. So it allows you to essentially um, you know, have feedback directly on the chip itself. So if you need to have, in this case, um, see what the sensor readings are, you have a little graphic there. And in this case, it's embedded into a larger robot that's um, just kind of displaying what, what functions are being triggered. Um, this is live right now. Um, so it's actually, these numbers are probably not even accurate. Yeah, and one of the things that we've seen a lot of our Arduino hard projects uh, come through over the last couple months, which I think you know something that we're really excited about. Um, you know, I think there's been a total of five projects, or you know, uh, hard projects that have uh, used Kickstarter um, so far to come to life, and you know, all those projects have been you know quite successful to date, and um, you know, and it's one of those things where uh, you know it's 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 just nice to kind of see, and these are all actual products that have Arduino inside so that you can reprogram them and kind of use them in different ways. Um, and uh, so now I think the, the next couple of examples I think are all uh, Arduino. Exactly, right. yeah. This is another really beautiful one. And, and again, um, an introduction to programming. Um, and this is targeting you know, very, very small children, so ages four to seven. And it's basically distilling uh, some of the basic ideas of programming into this very appealing, very tactile visual language. So. Um, this is an interface where you can create a program that will run, and this is a little, a little wheeled robot that will then follow these commands. So moving in different directions, turning, and it, it's really, you know, without actually getting into code and without actually using, knowing that you're using your Arduino, um, essentially programming it in this very simple way, and a great way to get kids to start thinking about the logic of programming. Yeah, so actually I have one of these here with me. This is one of the other boards that I've actually uh, got, which, uh, and actually the title here is incorrect. It's, it's, this is actually, oh, sorry. Uh, no problem. Uh, this is the Smart Citizen uh, board, and this is a really, really cool project from some guys out in Barcelona, where um, it's just a little board with all these different environmental sensors um, that, you know, you hook up and it actually connects to, um, um, it's connected to a, a repository online where it's pretty much logging data from smart citizens from all over the world uh, and collecting this kind of pretty consistent data from all these people all over the world and mapping it on, on, on you know, uh, geolocating all this kind of uh, data about, you know, the quality, I mean, everything from temperature, humidity to actually air quality um, and uh, sound, light, um, and, you know, it's, it's something that's been, you know, th this product ran maybe about a year ago. The, the actual boards were received. I received mine about two and a half months ago. Um, again, it's not yet uh, set up, but it's just like a really cool kind of citizen science type project. This is something that, you know, this product I think we were really passionate about for m many levels. I mean, one that, you know, for the, the, the few of us who really kind of like electronics, we, we were just kind of interested in seeing um, an electronics product package like this as a citizen science project, you know, which is something that we don't see that often, and uh, it's something that we'd like to see more of um, coming through um, the site. 
said the name was different than when you wrote yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's called Smart Citizen is actually the name of the project because the, the, this, the bare touch board is actually Sorry, the yeah, a holdover from uh, yeah, this, this other slide. Um, so this is, in, this is in fact the bare touch board, um, which is another Arduino at Heart project. Um, and this is, this is very cool. So it's, um, um, you know, bare, bare touch makes this interesting conductive paint, and this is a board that integrates with it so that you, this is actually little things that were painted on and they connect to the board to act as triggers. Um, and so it's a way of sort of prototyping without even having to solder, just by drawing and painting your circuits and kind of your interface directly in a very immediate way to, to build interaction. Yeah, no, this, this is one, um, another board that I, that, I'm, that I backed, <laughs> but I have not received it yet. Um, but it's really, it's really awesome. And, and uh, I mean, the Bear guys have been doing, you know, a lot of work with, you know, uh, painted circuits. And I mean, they even have conductive paint, conductive body paint. But this is kind of their first foray into actually developing a, a board specifically uh, for use with, uh, with uh, painted circuits. And then this is just a, a really fun one. Again, another Arduino at Heart project. This is a project called Little Robot Friends. And um, these are very kind of very simple um, beeping and flashing characters that um, both you can interact with. So they're responsive to light and sound. So depending on how you um, control those things, they'll respond to you. But also, they talk to each other. So they have different patterns that they'll flash and beep at each other and have little conversations. And it's also something that, in addition to there being a set program, you can tap into it and program it yourself and kind of have explore like, the most basic form of kind of communicating with a circuit in this way. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's just really kind of nice how they uh, were able to create something that's so dorky and so cute, and, uh, you know, and make it programmable so that you can kind of add your own behavior to it. Um, I think that's... Um, yes, yeah, so... There is one other project um, that we're excited about that's actually um, set to launch. Just a moment. The most project on our team has backed 1,500 projects. <laughs> yeah. Even he has his own film festival that he runs in the office for all of the, the film projects he's backed. Um, so this um, is a project that's set to launch actually on April Fool's Day, but it is entirely real. And this is um, an Arduino-based Kickstarter project idea generator. Um, so this is going to, we're certain, to send a ton of traffic to the site. Um, and, and so this guy Tim Ellis, he actually made a website that has been up for a while um, that. You know, you, uh, you click on it and you get yourself an idea for a Kickstarter project. So in this case, a Wi-Fi infrared elastic clock. <laughs> Definitely can make that with Arduino. Um, atomic polychromic paper mittens. Sure, why not? We'd, we'd approve it. Um, so, you know, we're really excited um, that this will have physical form powered by Arduino. And again, it's going to, I'm sure, triple, quadruple our numbers right. based on all these project ideas. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, this kind of, uh, that's pretty much it. You know, I think that gives you guys a, a good sense of, of just a little bit of what the kind of stuff that we see there. I mean, I think the message we want to get across here is that we love Arduino projects on Kickstarter, and uh, so if you have an Arduino project in mind and you're considering, uh, you know, how to bring it to life and how to fund it, you know, definitely um, think of Kickstarter as a, you know a possible approach, and, and um, you know, definitely what we recommend is just do some like take a look on our site, and I think you'll see a really big. Um, portfolio of projects and you can see, you know, you definitely can learn a lot from, from how our platform might be used for that. Uh, and now I think we have some time left that if you guys have any questions, um, you know, we'll turn it over to you guys. Yeah. Just, I mean, ho hopefully as you saw, there's a huge range. So everything from small project with a few hundred backers to thousands of backers. So it's not, not about always doing big projects. 
What's the definition of successful project? Well, I mean, I think successful project, uh, we usually just mean that they meet their, their funding target. So, funding target. Yeah, because for every project, they set that funding target, which is, it's an all or nothing model where if you meet your funding target, then you get all the money that's been pledged to your project. If you don't meet your funding target, then you don't get any money and the backers who back your project, you know, don't, don't, uh, yeah, don't, don't spend anything and they, they don't have to, um, just kind of that's a way to make sure that, you know, the backers only have to give you money if you make, if you're able to get enough money that you can actually bring a project to life. Uh, but for us, any product that meets the funding target, we consider successful, you know, I think, I mean, you see some projects that kind of way exceed the funding target uh, and you see some projects that just squeak by, but, you know, I think what we like to see is just, we like to see it, you know, the, the project will come to life, so. So the developer sets essentially the amount of money that they're looking for? Pretty much. Uh, they, they, they determine how much money they need. You know, it's based on, uh, you know, their understanding of, of uh, what work they need to do, both from, you know, uh, maybe additional design work to actual production work to actual shipping and fulfillment of the... Uh, and, and sometimes they'll do certain kind of, they'll give some rewards that are not directly related to the project from the standpoint they might be a promotional t-shirt or something. And then we always also want to make sure that they include, you know, think through, you know, really well in detail all these kind of little kind of costs that add up. Um, but it's really like, that's something that we don't kind of, we really, it's up to the creator to kind of figure that stuff out and figure out that budget and up to then the backers. Um, or pr prospective backers to kind of inquire and make sure that uh, if they have any, you know, if they don't trust that the creator has thought through that well enough, like it's, it's up to them to not back the project and to not, um, um, yeah, to make that. And all of this information is on your website? Yeah, uh, kickstarter.com. Um, and I mean, there's, there's, there's um, you know, you'll find the guidelines. There's a Kickstarter school slash handbook where there's some information and there's all, it's always also, there's a bunch of forums out there as well where you can also get get some feedback from actual creators that run projects. You know, so that's another kind of place to look. Okay. Okay. So there's the paperwork from the start, there's the statistics you were showing uh, that if you have a project and that does incorporate Arduino or some part of your prototyping, you should use that branding aspect to get the most uh, attention for not, not, not necessarily. I mean, I think I think I think that was more just to show how there's there is an active community on Kickstarter that's interested in Arduino projects. Right. It's not to say that you should use. Uh, actually, I think it's more. Um, I mean, uh, that Arduino community, I think, is more interested in real Arduino projects. Right. Like, if you just are doing a project that at some point in the past you use Arduino to prototype it, it's something that we're excited about because it's like we like, but it's not uh, something that we're recommending the creator. Uh, necessarily tout um, as a way to promote their project. It is something that will often, you know, projects on Kickstarter, the creator does need to talk about how their project was developed. Yeah. So often, you know, uh, that's something that, that will often come up in a lot of projects. But, but yeah, it was more just to show how the community is. Yeah, Do you guys it. help these people like putting the campaign together or? Um, um, minimally. I mean, we're, we're, we're mostly, you know, making sure that they're presenting things within our guidelines. We will give advice about, you know, how they're presenting things somewhat, but it's, you know, most people come to, to us and they, they know their product better than we do, and they know kind of what they need to do and kind of what it will take to actually realize this. Yeah. Does Kickstarter does track the point where the item is shipped or they're done in the product or just when they're reached the final goal? I mean, it? we don't formally track product. I mean, we would like... <coughs> We do, uh, usually, you know, once a product finishes funding, uh, the creators provide, provide updates on our site, and, uh, yeah. and most of the times the backers and creators are still talking in the comments section of a project. Yeah. And, um, and so we do actually track, pro like, like products where, the, where, where things really start falling apart, we do find out yeah. about them, and we do usually reach out to the creator. Like, we're, like ultimately, it's a contract between the creator and the backers. Yeah. Like that's we're not officially involved yeah, in that contract. But but it is something that that you know like we we care about the community and and and, and uh, you know we try to kind of grease those wheels so that like our big thing is usually like backers and creators should communicate. I mean the fact is projects on Kickstarter there is the risk that the project might not be able to be delivered. You know I think that's 
Like it, you're, you're backing somebody who's trying to bring something to life, yeah. you're not buying a finished product. Yeah. And that's a core part of what Kickstarter, of what the yeah. platform is about. But we also, you know, want to make sure that that's happening in a healthy way so that the creators are communicating openly with the backers. And so that if issues are arising, the backers should be finding out about it. And when we see that that's really not happening, we'll try to nudge it a bit. But there's no yeah. so but, much. but you know, as, as Julia said, like kind of the projects tend to live on through kick, on Kickstarter. So this is, for instance, an image from a project update that the ArduSat people sent out, actually showing the satellites deployed and in space. So you often do see the trajectory of the project and kind of understand that it has made it to people through the updates that happen on the Kickstarter page. How do you classify a project as a green or hard? You spoke of one project that was a small uh, display. It was MicroView or something. Like yeah. That. Actually, yeah. There were there were actually five of them that are part of that that program, and that's actually a program that that um, Arduino has started. And I'm sure I'm guessing Michael will talk about that more. Uh, we, we don't have an official slot for it, but once these up, I'm happy to take yeah. questions about it. Yeah. yeah. So we were just we were just pointing out that um, a number of those projects, a number of the projects that have kind of. Um, done the Arduino hard program have actually chosen to launch through Kickstarter, so there's a, an interesting connection. And, and I think for us, I mean, I mean, in terms of that type of thing, like, uh, you know, we we just, you know, when we, when we look at products, we just try to, because I think we are we are people who know about Arduino on the team, and uh, you know, we just when we look at a product, we try to look what, what like is this is this technically representing accurately, you know, how this you know. Um, Project relates to an Arduino, you know. So, uh, you know, Arduino Hard is a different thing in the sense that it's a real program. You know, when we other projects, you know, it's usually like they're Arduino compatible or something like that, which means that they actually, you know, they they use the same one of the chips that are also used in Arduino, you know, and and, and that they're but that also insinuates that there's not they haven't necessarily gone through the level of testing, for example, or, or, or any kind of they don't have a direct relationship with the Arduino brand as like an Arduino at hard project uh, would have. Thank you guys, sir. Oh, yeah. Can we take one last question, Tom? Yeah, uh, for, the, for the projects that didn't get funded, yep. were there any instances where it was a really good idea they missed? There's, I mean, there's clearly a bunch of... Like, what, how, why they missed? I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, there's there's a bunch of great ideas on Kickstarter that, that don't make it to life, and some of them, they just, you know, they're not able, I mean, to connect with the right community, they might set their funding goals too high. Uh, there is really like kind of a large uh, bucket of reasons why a campaign might be a good idea and might not be successful. But, but that said, I mean, many projects will kind of regroup and try again. So we've had plenty of projects that don't succeed the first time and then do a little bit more work, figure out a little bit more um, what their needs are, figure out how they can reduce their budget and come back and succeed. So yeah. um, there's definitely plenty of good stuff that does eventually make it. Thank you guys. Thanks.
Hello. That's great. Okay, um, so thanks all for coming. Um, uh, we figured we'd give you some proper welcoming remarks. Uh, Massimo Banzi, uh, one of our co-founders of Arduino, me, the other, one of the other co-founders. Uh, um, we just wanted to say welcome and, and thank you for coming uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Tom. So actually, we I haven't pre prepared any presentation with actually it's no slides, which is good. The only thing I, I wanted to highlight is this event is important because it's fundamentally an event that's been organized by the community all over the world. So we have something like 400 and something events in different parts of the world. And uh, there's like 120 events in Europe alone, which is interesting. And so, so I like this idea that we basically told the world, you know, you're using Arduino, you have communities where people are using Arduino and it's changing the way you work, the way you learn. So why don't you get together, which we, just, we give everybody an excuse to get together and, and sort of get to know each other better. And they responded very well. So now we have all these <laughs> things going on all over. The world. It was interesting because I wanna, when I woke up this morning, my Twitter was already like full of people mentioning us and, and me because it started off in China with our friends at Seed Studio. They started sort of the celebration and then it continued. And now in, in Europe, I received all these pictures from, from Italy. We, have, we are running one of the other official, let's put it this way, Arduino uh, days in, in, in Rome because we have also at the same time launched a new call for Maker for the next Maker Fair in Rome. It's gonna be the first week of October. Uh, so last year, 35,000 people showed up in Rome for the weekend, which was pretty amazing. And this year we expect to have at least 50 to 60,000 people. And so, you know, they, the community around Arduino is, is, is increasing a lot every day and um, you know, the only thing I can I can do now is just say this event is made by the community for the community, so it's essentially made by you. So we can only say that when we started working on Arduino, we didn't have any expectation it was going to become this big. We just wanted to make the life of our students easier. So I also want to say thank you to uh, first of all to all of you for coming, but also to some of the other organizations in town. We've got people here from Gen Space, we've got people here from Parsons, we've got people here from Tembu and Space Brew, and it was kind of an experiment this day because all of us in the various schools and hacker spaces and, and organizations tend to kind of run our own events and 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 on our own shows and so forth. And when Massimo uh, suggested Arduino Day to us, uh, I said, well. Let's invite everybody and see who shows up um, and see if we could actually do something where we all do it in one space. First time, we got a few. It's a good start. Let's try <laughs> and do it again. Um, so uh, we're, we're really excited to see everybody here, and, and, and hopefully we'll do some more of that as, as time goes by, and we hope others will too. Um, 
mostly today uh, in terms of today's, today's remarks. Should we just open it up to questions? Yeah, I mean, if we, we thought we could use a piece of, like, a part of the time we have uh, for actually for questions. So if you want to ask questions, we're here. You don't have to. It's fine. <laughs> Sure. It's not meant are you guys going to do some work on converting uh, strings to floats? Because that's one of the problems that I've been having recently with. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow, that's <laughs> very technical. Right into the dev form, OK. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is some. There's, a, there's some libraries for it, but it's, it's really annoying. It takes up a lot of space in the Arduino itself right now. There is some work happening on the. Like so there's a mailing list called developers at arduino.cc. That you can sign up to, and those, that's the place where the developers who develop the Arduino itself right, hang right. out, and that's like where the hardcore nerdy stuff happens. Yeah. And so I'm, I, I read the messages, but I, I let them sort of play with the code. And uh, I, I think it's worth mentioning that our our full time development staff at this point is two. <laughs> um, so we get to things as, as, as fast as we can and it's, uh, we're, as a company we're growing and part of the challenge is to figure out how much of their time goes into maintenance, how much of their time goes into new products and so forth. So hopefully we'll get there on it. Um, but we, what, what has happened over the last really year or so since Christian Malier took over the, the developers list is through uh, his and Federico Fasori's work and through the, the uh, issues list on GitHub, they've been squashing a lot more of those issues uh, faster than we have in the past. So make sure it's on there and yes. And also there's a, so we have seen a lot more contributions. So right now it is much, much easier for people to just submit the patch and also because we, you know, we switched to GitHub which makes it very easy for yeah. people to contribute. So you should send a pull request. Uh, at least once a week, Christian, looks at all the pull requests and pulls in a lot of them. So I know there's been some discussion about that uh, to, in order to fix it. The issue now that Arduino starts to have is that since we have a history and we have a number of products that people are using, it becomes more and more compli mm. complicated to change something without breaking the whole thing. Yes, do it now and, yeah. and every time we have to break something in order to improve life later on, yeah. then I have to spend a week with people complaining and <laughs> like posting, ah, you idiots, what the hell are you doing? You know, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, what is the future of the Arduino uh, Internet of Things space? You know, what, what do you do and what's your plan? I, I know we introduced like Internet, Arduino, uh, CART, and also Wi-Fi one now, but do you want to Well, actually, you know, the people were doing Internet of Things with Arduino back in 2007. No, I know. So, I know. so in a way, no, no, what I'm saying is that, you know, we've been doing that kind of stuff before it was cool, as usual. And, uh, and so we started to, but in our case, you know, it's easy to just take an Arduino and stick a Wi-Fi module to it. Everybody can do that. And in fact, everybody's doing it. But very few people are doing something where once you stick that Wi-Fi module to the Arduino, it then becomes something that you can use. Uh, even if you're not a nerd. So our objective is always to try to figure out products which make it very easy for people to enter into a particular space and, and make it very easy for them. So we spend quite a bit of time working on this Arduino Yun. And, and we think we, you know, by combining a small Linux machine with Wi-Fi and an Arduino, but also creating the software that lets the two parts kind of communicate with each other. And also we had this great collaboration with Tembu, which sort of added the ability to kind of to talk to hundreds of different APIs. So we made a tool which really allows you to make a toaster which speaks to Facebook or whatever in 10 minutes, which given that you want to do something like that. So in a way for me, it's important like this. Also, we're looking at uh, a cheaper and simpler Wi-Fi module. So we are working on a Wi-Fi module. Yeah, that's a problem for us too. I mean, we since we're not a silicon manufacturer, we're kind of beholden to what is out there. Um, we're constantly on the search for new ones. We're constantly uh, working with companies who are making them. Um, but until we reach the point where we're a large enough and wealthy enough company that we have a fab house, <laughs> uh, we're kind of going to work with what's in the market. The other thing we're trying to do, and, and I think that the Tembu point speaks to this uh, a lot, is there's also a good bit of complexity around being on the internet. And uh, we, when we started with the microcontroller stuff, we tried to address that complexity. Um, 
we're trying to do that when we talk about network complexity now too, and that's where Tembu has been very helpful. Uh, we hope we're going to continue to do that kind of thing. But that part is outside the Arduino chipset, right? No, that's not outside of what Arduino is. It's outside the hardware, but Arduino isn't just the chipset. See, the, the, I think one of the issues that uh, we sometimes have when we talk about Arduino is that people tend to focus on the piece of hardware. While Arduino is a whole ecosystem, which is made of hardware, software, people, ideas, and all of that. So, for example, when we made the GSM module for Arduino, there's lots of GSM modules out there. But we spent an insane amount of time coming up with an agreement with Telefonica, the mobile operator, which puts a SIM card in every board. And we created a very, very simple setup process. So you can, in five minutes, you put the SIM card, you're online. So I think Arduino has value in this kind of things, where we put together a package, which is the hardware, the software, how to use that, and all of that in one single package. One of the things we're learning, uh, I'll, I'll just say this real quick, one of the things we're learning as we go, um, we are a small company relative to the hardware, the larger ones, and as you know, we've started to work with some of the larger companies, and that's definitely a learning process, both for us and for them. Um, there are moments where we look at each other and go, can we do this together? Oh gee, we can't, you know? But um, the fun part about it is, is figuring that out. Um, what, we, what our hope is to try, to try and reach some of those things um, that you're talking about. But I do think that it's a long-term process. It involves us and those other companies. And the more they hear demand from customers as well, the more we make that happen. web-based IDE for Arduino, and there's a very specific reason why I'm asking that. There's um, a lot of people who are being introduced to Chromebooks, and then there's a kind of disconnect between the physical uh, computing uh, accessibility and the kind of low cost of the Chromebook, and kind of trying to get these things kind of working in an educational environment. And I was thinking that it would be you know, really wonderful to have a web-based IDE could function on a Chromebook and have that uh, program. Uh, what time are you giving the day? Uh, actually, we're, we're not going to show that part of it, but I can. We, the, the, the Tembu guys are going to do some of that. Anyway. Um, so I can, I can sneak preview it if you want, yeah, when we do that. Anyway, so today, yes. actually, we are going to show some preview of this new Arduino tri-board. Uh, which carries its own IDE inside. So it's an HTML5 based IDE. So the way you program that board is by point, you hook up the board to the network, and then you point your browser at it, and it's all HTML5, JavaScript, and you can compile. And, uh, and so actually, this, is the, this is the first item. The idea is that that IDE will be then integrated into the website later in the year. So you'll be able to kind of code within the website. And then the plan is that longer term, we will deliver that also as a desktop uh, app. So in a way, we will be able at some point to unify all the development environments under one, uh, one code base. Because also our issue is that, again, we are a small, <laughs> small group of uh, people working on it. And so we can't have like seven different technologies happening. And HTML5 has a lot of promise in terms of how we can, what we can build with it. So in other words, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was, yeah. So on the same lines of questioning, what do you guys think about building an emulator? Like, oh. you, sure. like you have an yeah. emulator that exists itself? Or? So we generally haven't built emulators, and there's, there's a reason for that. Um, it, it kind of has run counter to our personal teaching philosophy. Um, we have tended to try and teach in a way that th it's faster and easier to learn by physically building than by building the emulator, but by emulating. Now, um, if somebody else wants to build an emulator like a few have, great, go for it. That's why we open source this stuff. We haven't put our own resources into it because it's just, it kind of runs counter to the way we work personally. I He's not looking for emulator, he's looking for some kind of debugger. Uh, oh. The problem is like when you compile everything dump inside the Arduino, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, and well, let's, let's make sure he, that's what you're looking for. Uh, so basically what I, I mean, my line of questioning was around this whole teaching concept. So if I'm teaching a class of students, say, of, of 30 people, I cannot have, say, I'm not able to afford 30 Arduino. So if I could have something like an 
emulator that I could emulate and still demo and ask the students to also try at the same time. And it's still have a couple of battery levels where they could come in and then push their programs to and test it. Yeah. But for the basic uh, few projects like just blinking an LED or going to a thermo sensor or something like that, we could still have it here. Yeah, I mean honestly it's just not it's not high on our agenda for, for the reasons we mentioned. Um, I, I don't think we would say no if somebody built it, but until they have, we've got the resources. They have, but they're charging yeah. for it. So in a way, yeah, it costs less to, for you to buy a real Arduino. Yeah. <laughs> Even a Chinese copy. I mean. Are you guys? You guys getting very old? The Chinese copies that are coming out that are very cheap, but at the same time, sort of let's say just have this brand now where even if somebody you know is aware that you can get them for basically really cheap because it's made maybe not the same quality but it seems like the way I see it is people still buy the original Arduino just because it I don't know you have the brand set up very well to the point where there's more of an incentive to buy a, an actual Arduino even if it's more expensive than the you're kind of answering your own question there yeah yeah no, <laughs> Yeah. Thanks you know, for the answer. It, it, it is an issue with the people who use um, people who use our branding and our graphics on their board because they're obviously trying to deceive people, saying you know this is an original board, and obviously they don't. Since they don't need to develop any code, they don't need to maintain the code. They don't need to. They don't do returns. Yeah. You buy it on eBay. It doesn't work. They say to you, well, you know, come find me. And so, in a way, there is this problem that. Uh, that one, I think it's, it's, it is a bit of a problem because it also reflects on us sometimes. Some, sometimes people show up on the forum and they say, oh, I bought this Arduino, it doesn't work. And then I'm looking at the picture and so I'm sorry to break your heart, but this is a copy. Yeah. And that one is particularly difficult to do because you know they come from countries where you know, trademark protection is kind of like... Not very well. Yeah, it's not something they they do so, so in a way you know slowly some of them are learning and they start to add their own branding to the board and they start to develop their own things I think it's you know slowly will be less of a problem yeah the, the, the ones that are actually doing their own branding there's there there are a lot of them out there and that are actually quite good and we're happy mm -hmm. to see that yeah. happen so within the space of larger projects and businesses I've heard of this concept that they often call the trough of sorrow. Are you guys familiar with this? No. So you start a project, you get really excited about it, and then you know, you're excited about it for a little bit, and at a point you run into an obstacle that makes things difficult, and you almost feel like giving up on the project, or, or it takes a lot more grit to move through it. Oh, you mean every third Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wondered if there was anything any a particular point in your guys' process of this project where you kind of had to push past a point where you might have called it quits. I, I, I joke, but I think that actually then. happens every third Wednesday. No, I mean it does happen, and and you know you you do push past it. It's you figure out how you. Sometimes they're technical problems. Sometimes they're business problems. Sometimes they're personal problems. Um, and the one thing we try to uh, stop me if I'm wrong on any of this, but one thing we try to do is. Just keep talking and planning, and try and keep good communication open. Um, when it comes to the business problems there, it takes a lot of creative thinking, and it takes a lot of saying, OK, how much of this do we know, and how much of this do we need to get some advice on? Um, and you know, in some ways, if you, if you do things, I was going to say if you do things well, but I think the other answer is if you get lucky, you have good friends around who will say, you know what, maybe you want to try this for a while. Um, I don't think there's one answer to that question, but yes, it, I think it is a, a common thing. And the best answer is keep aware of each other and try and keep some self-awareness. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think also the, one of the other issues, another way to look at this is that as you progress with any idea, there's a question of scaling. So every time you add a zero at the end of whatever, it becomes incredibly to make that jump becomes very complicated. So at the beginning, you get some random manufacturer to make the first Arduinos. You don't care. You sell them cash to people who need them because you know them personally. And then suddenly, you need to send an Arduino to somebody you know, over the internet. So, you know, they, they order it over the internet. You have to set up the whole thing. You need a business that does. So you know, every time you reach another level, the amount of work you need to do to kind of get to that level is a big hurdle that you need to you know, when we were signing the contract 
to distribute the Arduinos with Radio Shack. Radio Shack is used to dealing with very, very large companies, and they're, you know, they're using, they're tough at negotiating, and their contract is surreal. You know, I saw it, it's like a Bible. It has things like, it says things like, if you're selling this product in California, Vermont, and South Dakota, and your packaging is made of more than 70% plastic, it needs to be done in a certain way. And there's like sections and sections of this stuff. And, you know, you look at it like, what the <laughs> hell is, why, you know? And so you understand that like classic businesses have got this, all these kind of layers and they're like geological layers of stuff that you need to drill through in order to, you know, to emerge. And so that's, that's one of the problems. Yeah, I well, think congratulations on getting through every other one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. In, in regards to you brought up the Radio Shack thing, because I was pretty happy when I actually went to Radio Shack and saw them kind of getting back to this old electronics, like, mm -hmm. you know, thing. Is, but I have this fear, is this the golden age? Like, is this a short term? Like you're saying, there's a lot of red tape dealing with them possibly. Like, how, how, is, how has Radio Shack in, affected Arduino and, and is, this, is it gonna grow? Well, in a way, I have to say that, you know, what I mentioned, all this red tape and everything else, I think this is stuff that Radio Shack has to deal with in order to be all over the US. Mm -hmm. So this is not something they, <laughs> I'm sure they would love to give you a contract which is like 10 lines. We'll buy the board, we sell them, thank you very much. You know, and the problem is that when you, when you are all over the US, that's obviously gets complicated. I think in general, the Radio Shack deal is, 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 was important because it brought Arduino on uh, everywhere in the US. So there was, I read an article somewhere that said that every American is at most, I don't know how many miles away from a Radio Shack. So in a way, potentially, it's a great distribution channel. And I went to a Radio Shack event uh, for resellers, and there was a lot of people from you know, uh, different parts of the US coming saying, oh yeah, now the college next to where I have the shop is now doing uh, using Arduino, we're gonna buy it. And so you get to talk to the people. So it's, it becomes really granular. And there's a whole section of the market of people that still are not into buying online. They prefer to go to a place where they can talk to a person. Uh, so in a way, I think it's, imp uh, in a, in a, when you run a business at some point, you have to hit the, the retail barrier. Yeah. I think another part of it though is that, you know, Radio Shack, as you say, you know, they're they're hitting problems right now too. Anytime you do have those sort of magnitude leaps, you can't stop. It doesn't mean that you can rest and you're done with that now. So we constantly have to say, okay, that's going fine now. What's the next channel we need to look at or how do we keep the health of that relationship? And and also you have to keep in mind that you when you make partnerships, you only have so much control over what your partnership is. You do your part of the job as best as you can, and you hope that they keep going the way they're going. And if not, you hopefully have other partnerships too. Was, um, uh, yeah, on the point that Radio Shack is in trouble, and they seem to be having to make some decisions about how much to eat, do it yourself stuff to include in each of their stores, and some stores will have more, some stores will just be consumer stuff. I wonder if there's, maybe there's no way to know this, but I wonder if putting Arduinos in the stores, if, because you can't just get an Arduino, you have to get the yeah, rest of the components stuff. to use with them, if that's influencing them to try to keep as much of that, you know, the big electronic shelves in the stores as much as possible, because you need that. I think you'd have to ask them. Um, but I mean, that's obviously one of the reasons, one of the reasons why we did the starter kit uh, which has been selling quite nicely, um, and you hope that they will do that. You, on that starter kit, which is a wonderful thing, because we have bought now a number of boards. So far, I think we have three Uno's, one Yun, four Uno's, a Yun, and a bunch of sensors. So our and shields and shields, yeah. And one of the things that I definitely we've both been seeing is uh, depending on the, the sensors you're buying, there's no documentation, you spend a lot of time trying to get to work, blah, 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 that's fine. But that kit that you guys, we were up and running in no time. Is there something that you could do, perhaps a spin off, that would allow more of that? Because, like the working Yuma, for example, you know, is trying to get the Wi Fi working on that, it's real pain in the butt. We still didn't succeed on that one yet. Oh, wow. The Uno was a piece of cake with the Ethernet. 
That was like one, two, three, boom, done. But one of the things you're getting at is actually back, gets back to his point yeah. about the Internet of Things. Yeah, so um, he's an expert in the Internet, I know. Um, and so one of the one of the things you we're learning as we make more complex products is that you do need to do not just more support but more explanation, um, and that t to my mind anyway, and I'm speaking for Tom here rather than the whole company. So tell me when I'm speaking differently. That makes me tend to want to take products uh, slow and thorough, but at the same time, I get really excited when I see that there actually has been a good bit of success with the UN. One of the interesting challenges with the network is no two networks are the same. Um, and I think it, it makes me feel very good to hear that the starter kit worked because that, that says good documentation helps too. Oh, no. Right? I think it's, it's huge. Cool. I think it's a huge piece of it because at least for our experience, he's a mechanical engineer, I'm not. But I'm a very, you know, I'm a programmer type. Mm -hmm. right? So between the two of us, we've been doing a lot of experiments, and you know that that book and the whole kit together just launched us because you do want immediate feedback. You don't mind playing, but at some point, if it doesn't work and you keep trying and experimenting and it's failing, it's like okay, I got to go do something else, and I can't, you know. Yeah. But that kit was a very quick success. We were able to get things built, and then once we were able to follow your steps and get things built, then we were like, okay, now let's go do blah blah blah. We started getting our creative juices flowing to be able to expand upon that. Cool. But that kit was what kicked it off. Good to hear. If you could do more of that when you're we doing are, the Youngs and, and all the rest right. of these, that would be really yeah, fabulous. Definitely. Because on the that agenda. is the thing that, you know, because I, I, I don't know how much money I've spent so far on this stuff, but <laughs> it's been about a good amount. And I'm, I'm happy to keep doing it because I love the whole thing. I just love it. Cool. And, uh, but, the, but please do more of those, the whole package with the, with the documentation, with the kit, with all those pieces, because that is a fabulous thing. I mean, to touch briefly on the Wi-Fi thing, mm -hmm. uh, it's funny because a number of people have said, oh, the UNI is great, it's, we love it. It's finally a lot of things are just simple. So clearly, there's a, uh, as Tom said, no networks are the same, but there is also an inherent problem in the way the Wi-Fi is still quite um, not very user-friendly. Yeah. So because the way you configure the Wi-Fi on the UN is that you press a button, the UN becomes and uh, creates a network, you hook up to that network, you configure your network. Uh. So that was, that was the simplest way. But the funny thing is that I have meetings now with like big silicon vendor companies who like billions of dollars. Say, ah, we solved the problem of hooking up a device to the network. And then they show me exactly what the UN does, but worse, because maybe the interface is really, really weird. You know? It's a like classic design by an engineer web page. You know, so this kind of... This kind of stuff, <coughs> so the, the industry itself hasn't really figured out a, a secure, a safe and simple way to basically say to a device, okay, let's, you know, yeah. this is the network in this room, press a button, boom, hook up. Yeah. Because there, is, there are some standards, but they have uh, security issues. So, you know, people yeah, can kind of get into your network. So in a way, there are some problems in the industry that industry is not solving. And so this whole internet of things, it's not going to take off until they fix these issues. Yeah. We should actually stop because there's yeah. another session starting in, in two minutes ago. Um, but thank you guys very much. Thank you for coming. And please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. And um, we'll start the next talk very soon.
the guys from Tembu here with us. As we mentioned, um, we've been working very closely with Tembu on uh, the Yuin and uh, on our new uh, Pre as well, um, although it's still theoretical in their minds, they haven't seen one yet, but they will soon. Um, they've been really instrumental in, in our thinking about um, the, I prefer the phrase connected devices. Um, They've done a great job of making it possible to connect to so many different web services through a common API, programming interface. And then when we started working with Mono Partnership, they made it even simpler. So um, I, I, I applaud them because I didn't think it was going to be possible to make it that simple to program an Arduino to connect to the net, and these guys have done it. Um, so let me introduce uh, Vaughn and Tim from Tembu. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Tom. It's a great introduction. Uh, thanks to NYU ITP and the whole Arduino team and everyone for coming. Uh, also, want to say happy birthday, Arduino. Um, <laughs> Tim Buzla, you know, we've we've really loved working with Arduino. You know, we started out doing more uh, like software type stuff and services, and but we've always been fans, and it's been incredible working on Arduino hardware. Um, so, as Tom mentioned, I'm, I'm Vaughn, this is Tim, uh, we work at Timbu, and uh, I'll give a quick uh, presentation about Timbu, and then we'll do a demo. So, I can go to the next slide. Um, so what's Timbu? So Timbu, we've created a unique library uh, in the cloud of over 2,000 programming processes. And basically, if you want to use any of these processes in your code, you can test them out on our website, and then generate a code snippet to run that process in over eight different programming languages. What do these processes do? Um, well, chiefly they connect to over, you can go to the next slide, uh, to over 100 APIs, such as the ones here. Uh, we, they can also connect you to databases easily, like a MySQL database. And we also have a library of code utilities that make development easier. So you get a lot of benefit from streamlining your code and developing faster. Next. So uh, this past year, we teamed up with Arduino to work on the Arduino Yun. The Yun was the first Arduino with a Linux chip, and also the first Arduino to be internet enabled out of the box. So you don't need a Wi-Fi shield, you don't need an Ethernet shield. Um, and basically, our thinking was you know, we would put the cloud, or the Timbu cloud, inside this microcontroller device to make it much more powerful, not only more easy to develop and program with, but extend its capabilities. So how did we actually do that? Well, there, we, uh, for the Arduino Yun, there's actually a small Timbu client that lives on the Linux chip. And then we have a library uh, that is part of the Arduino IDE. And basically, you can use uh, you know, Arduino sketch language to program a, a Timbu interaction. Uh, the bridge library on the Yun talks to the Linux chip. The Linux uh, makes a HTTP request to the Timbu cloud and then runs whatever uh, API interaction you need. And then the Timbu cloud can also do things like uh, pre-parse data for you so that your board doesn't get overloaded um, with a long API response. So there's a lot of benefits from using the cloud in a microcontroller like this. Um, just this past week, we uh, extended our compatibility with the, the wider Arduino family. So we've added support for Arduino Uno, Due, Mega, and uh, other Arduino compatible devices. Um, this was an interesting challenge in the sense that, you know, obviously these boards have been out for years. There's no Timbu client pre-installed on them. So we had to figure out, you know, a new way to make them work and also to, you know, address the compatibility issues with different types of shields and make everything program easy, because that's what Timbu, Timbu's goal. Um, here's a big overview of the Timbu platform. It's like a nice uh, schematic that uh, Tim here actually designed. Um, so when you go on the Timbu website, you can browse all the, 
the choreos or choreographies, that's the name for our pre-built processes on the platform. So you know, for hundreds of APIs or databases or code utilities, you can test them out on our platform or on the website rather, and then uh, generate a code snippet. You put that code snippet, which is a normalized, generally about five lines of code, depending, give or take, on whatever language you're using. Um, but for the Arduino Yun, for instance, you take that code snippet, put it in your, in your sketch, then you know, uses the bridge library to talk to the Timbu client on the Linux chip, which then makes you know, HTTP requests to Timbu. The Timbu platform then puts together the longer process uh, and, and runs that, connects to whatever API or web service you need, and then shoots the data back to the board. Um, so it's an interesting way of sort of virtualizing your code. Next, um, the flip side, uh, uh, you know, a complement to all of this is not only the the technical aspect, but also supremely good documentation. Uh, basically, our goal at Timbu, uh, when we work with Arduino, is to get people, you know, to have a, qu a quick win uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and often that happens, you know, setting up your Arduino, connecting it to Timbu, and getting your first. API action uh, happening in you know under 10 minutes, like five to eight minutes, which is really cool and really fast. And so this is just an example of kind of the tutorials and stuff on on our website to get you working really quickly with you know posting to Facebook, to interacting with Twitter, sending sensor data to Google spreadsheets to to sort of begin uh, give you the starting point for uh, more advanced projects. Next. Um, so now I'll actually show you uh, the Timbu website, and you'll get a, a sense of how this whole flow works and how this user experience or developer experience uh, works within the Timbu library. Um, so we have you know, these like getting started pages similar to Arduino for all the languages we support. Uh, on the left side of the library is this really long tree of all the APIs and other Timbu Choreos uh, actions that you can work with. Um, like, for instance, all these utilities. Uh, we can show you quickly what it's like to test out an API interaction on the Timbu website. So we can go to, for instance, DuckDuckGo. It's a simple, uh, it's a private web search API. Uh, you can type in a query here to see, you know, and test it out on the website. You can see what kind of output the API will give you, so you can get a sense of how to work with that data. And then if you want to incorporate that, that Quario, into your program, you simply have the sample code right here. We have a drop-down menu that'll immediately generate it in any of these languages, and then you just simply copy and paste it right into your code. Yeah, and so, so all the languages are accessible here, and something we did different for, um, so for most of our languages, we have short code snippets, but for Arduino and processing, we generate um, complete sketches that you can run, run immediately. Um, Cool. Yeah. And um, recently in uh, January, we came out with this thing called the Device Coder, which will generate a complete uh, Arduino sketch for you that will do something like take a sensor, t take sensor data, and initiate an action like sending an email, sending an SMS, writing to a MySQL database. So you can see, you know, Tim is, is navigating through here. You go to you can choose you know, what devices. Right now we have Arduino Yun and then the other Arduino boards. Uh, it'll give you a selection of sensor types uh, that you can uh, use, use for your project. And then the sensor type will, can trigger uh, an action. So in this instance, we'll use, I guess, a motion sensor uh, to log uh, data to a Google spreadsheet. So and yeah, we have Tim will talk about it. Yeah, proximity sensor here. <coughs> and I'm going to demo that in a sec, but first I wanted to just show this new feature. So as a complement to the other sections of the library, um, we have this, as Fawn said, this device coder feature where you can both kind of generate, so it's building upon the generating the entire sketch, so taking in what sort of sensor you're using and what sort of conditions then trigger the call to the API. So, and as Vaughn mentioned, we have, yeah, email, phone, SMS, and yeah, we're adding, keep adding more there. But for the demo, we're going to um, show a, how to log sensor values into a Google spreadsheet, which is, yeah, pretty useful. 
So here you can select the pin. So we're going to have pin 6 as the output and to trigger the LED and analog pin 0 for the input where this is connected to and put in the name of your spreadsheet and you can send what kind of value you send out and we're going to have it trigger whenever you're greater than 400. Okay. So you generate this and you can download the whole sketch or kind of copy it and paste it into the IDE and then upload it, which we've already done to this board. So plug in this board. Bring up my spreadsheet. Second lot. Oh, yeah. Pizza. It's loading up. But anyway, the, basically what, what will happen is when the, the proximity sensor you know, senses a value above, above that threshold, it then logs it to the Google spreadsheet. And the cool thing about this is not only is this really quick to set up, I mean, and you can effectively set this all up without actually writing any code yourself. Here we go. Generating it on the website. Um, so the light went off. So yeah. And basically what's happened is it'll, it'll trigger the, the light to go on, log, log these data values onto the, the Google spreadsheet, which sometimes there's a little bit of a lag with the, the spreadsheet API. Um, and then uh, a cool thing about uh, what Part of the way that this works is that since so much of this is happening on, on the Timboo platform, you're actually conserving a lot of RAM on the device. Uh, and for example, here with the, with the Sketch Builder, we save a lot of these inputs or uh, settings that are part of the Sketch onto the Timboo platform so that you can here even, oh yeah, here we go, now it's grabbing, <laughs> awesome. And you can do things like, um, sometimes uh, go in, go onto the Timbu website and change, for instance, what spreadsheet this is going to write uh, val values to, or you know, what phone number you want uh, the, the sensor, uh, the Ar Arduino to call. You can change sort of aspects of it, like, like you can your code, you, like You that. can change it on our site without having to re-upload the sketch to Arduino, so, so I can, um change this to, I have another spreadsheet called More Sensor Values, and I'll just change the name of that here, and save my inputs. And now, instead of generating here, they'll generate in this spreadsheet, without having to re-upload the sketch or change your sketch code yeah. at all. Cool. And so, yeah, it's, Yeah, capturing the kind of the analog output of the sensor, and then I'm also tracking just how many seconds since the yeah. sketch started running. But, but you could kind of adjust these to anything you want, basically at any type of yeah. sensor, and kind of adjust kind of what you're saving, um, what sort of data you're saving. But the just the really cool thing is it makes it so much quicker um, to just like try something out mm -hmm. and see how it works, and then you can kind of customize it and adjust it yeah. as you go. Um, and I can show too. I also have this this button um, set up to a Twitter account. So you can see that was the last one was an hour ago. And when I refresh, there's six the seconds. six seconds ago. So I have it. I have kind of this sketch hooked up to both spreadsheets and Twitter, um, and it's. Pretty easy because I just kind of set up in in the sketch the conditions to trigger each of the kind of the um, the code that I copied from from our library and just kind of set up the conditions to trigger them and then yeah it can trigger kind of whatever API call yeah. that you want. And an interesting thing about <coughs>
What's that? Sorry. Can you push an entirely new sketch down into the AppML chip from the web? For, or through the IDE. Yeah, through um, the, not, not through not, the Tembu interface. Not through the Tembu, okay. but through yeah. the IDE. Um, yeah. yeah. You can, but <laughs> but you can you can change certain things like on on our side like yeah. because we we make it so you um, can save things like credentials so you could change which Gmail account you're connecting to or which yeah. spreadsheet you're connecting to that you could change on our site offline but I mean off and that's outside something of the, yeah, that Arduino. we plan to sort of uh, bring out more as as we build up the, the sketch builder is this sort of idea of being able to reprogram or change activity uh, on the device by making adjustments on the cloud rather than having to actually touch the code on the Arduino, which is a cool way of thinking about reprogramming hardware and also extending you know, MCU capabilities, you know, since these are, in general, resource Somebody constrained. Asked about that in the last talk. Oh, OK. Kind of, yeah, OK. <laughs> kind of um, How about more complex sensors? Like simple ones like So yeah, so we have a. Excuse me, can you repeat the question? So, yeah, he was asking about um, more complex sensors and if we how we support them and um, yeah, so we do support um, several in our in our device coder. We we have multiple sensors and we also have this generic. Um, sensor that you can kind of, you can use as a starting point. But there's definitely some, um, I mean, yeah, the more complicated the sensor, there's strange normalization and stuff that, so we don't have all of that built into here, but, but this is definitely the starting point to kind of bring in whatever sensor you want yeah. and connect it to the API. So. The more complex ones. Yeah. Yeah, but the um, but we kind I mean, of I have think the. It's, it's worth mentioning that you know this came out basically at the end of January, or you know so it's it's very new and and in that time we've we have these sensor types. We just last week added support for a bunch more Arduino boards and basically uh, we plan to keep you know an aggressive yeah, schedule we're, like that. So we're it's growing really this section a lot. So if if anyone has any requests or for yeah. anything, um, yeah, send it. Send it to yeah. hey at Tembu. And I think, you know, ideally we we build it out with um, you know, different types of like health monitoring sensors and and different, you know, sensors that are in high demand, ad adding uh, a more complex array uh, of actions that can be triggered and then eventually getting to a point where you can think about, you know, multiple Arduino devices and, and program programming them. But um, you know, there's lots more to come. Yeah. And these save sets of inputs, you can have multiple ones, so you could have kind of different versions of it that you could, um, yeah. Just one thing, yeah. Um, I believe like when you change the sensor in this case, one of the complex ones, you need to actually upload the sketch over and over again. You will not be able to like do the same trick on the website. Like imagine that I put just a simple button, right? You upload the sketch, it looks for just the, um, one of the pin six. But I, after that, I install a temperature sensor, it just some other things, right? Um, and then your sketch is going to be redundant because it's not going to understand. Yeah, it depends on the type of. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, if you switch from a digital to an analog, then yeah, then the then you 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 would change that. But yeah, we can. Um, but yeah, definitely, it's. Yeah, I mean, we can. Something we can we'd like to talk more about. Talk at talk at the table about like different uh, <laughs> different varieties of, of what actually needs to change in the sketch versus what needs to change on on the cloud. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Hey there. Is there a limit to the number of calls that you make to the Tembu server in terms of uh, is there a daily limit or something? Or yeah. It's for developers? So the, the question is, is there a limit to the number of calls you can make uh, to Tembu? Um, so with, with Tembu, we have basically a, a generous free plan where you get 1,000 Tembu calls a month. Though uh, for um, students or people doing basically non-commercial projects, we're actually pretty flexible on that. You can email me and we can give you more. Or, or even if you're working on potentially a commercial project, but you're in that testing phase where you just need to run you know, thousands and thousands of calls and things like that, you know, we, can work, we can work with that. Um, that's also, you know, it depends. Uh, you know, APIs have their own like, rate limiting, basically. So sometimes uh, you know, if, if Google is only lets you make a certain number of, of calls, you know, that, that's another factor to consider. 
and then and then beyond that, you know, then we have like paid plans starting at nine dollars a month. So it's it's very affordable. Mm -hmm. Yep. If I understand correctly, then all well, this is being run through your websites and through your servers. In other words, it's uh, not even like this code itself is on the Yun, but rather the Yun is parsing this server using this code, and then it's going to your Google accounts. It's going to everything else. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm trying to get a better understanding. Of yeah, basically, so like the, the Timbu code that you're using is, is, is basically it's not a, a, on the hardware, it's yeah, on your Yeah, exactly. And so for something with like a microcontroller, the, the idea behind that is that it will save a lot of RAM right. and enable a lot more capabilities from, from devices. And, you know, it's interesting to think, you know, a lot of these Arduino boards have been out for years and now we're adding new capabilities. It's like what, what can happen once you get that one hook into the cloud, you, there's sort of almost a, an infinite amount of, of possibilities there. And I think it's important to think about that when you think about connected hardware, uh, when we have a world where we're, there's going to be potentially thousands of objects you know, buried in highways or roads or you know, across shipping containers, agricultural fields. These are all going to be things that will need to be flexible and can't be replaced every two years like you replace your cell phone. We've got to think about you know, how to make connected hardware backwards and forwards compatible in a bunch of different ways. I think we are out of time, um, but we are have a table out there, and I would love to talk to anyone and answer any more questions there. Just before they leave, I want to I shower a little bit more praise on them because uh, one of the things that happened in development of, of uh, the partnership with Arduino is that um, I kind of yelled at these guys a little bit about how important I think comments are in code. And one of the love things about the device coder is their comments are better than my comments. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I love you for that. So, yeah, it, as a teacher, you can actually teach off of their code from the device coder, which is useful. Uh, so a couple more minutes, and then we'll see Space Group. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Okay. Um, so next up, um, we've got Brett and Julio from uh, Space Brew. Uh, Space Brew is a project that originated uh, at the Rockwell Group Labs um, as a tool for doing uh, exhibit design, lots of uh, various network devices and exhibit design. It has since um, emerged from, uh, from Rockwell Group. Both of them are now working in other places. Uh, as, as are the many of the other people who worked on it. And it's really become a very useful tool for connecting lots of interactive devices together very quickly. Um, it's, uh, it's a really interesting tool for, well, exactly that. And uh, so I'll let them talk. Cool. Great. Are we on? Yes? We're good? OK, cool. Um, so we're going to start, as with anyone, with this uh, quick video that is very confusing. But I think you guys will enjoy it. <laughs> And this is the Rockwell Group space right around the corner. It is as crazy as it looks. So that's it. I think you guys probably get it, and uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> um, so what is Space Brew? I keep hearing people ask that. Um, so this is our like long description, but we'll get into some more detail for a little bit. But um, we like to call it a service and a toolkit for choreographing interactive spaces. So the way that a choreographer sets up a group of dancers or whatever um, and says, you go here, you do this, and these are um, this is the relationship you're going to have and move through space um, is the way we like to think about interactive inputs and outputs. Um, and so what we do is make it really easy to uh, connect different things to each other um, and um, connect them very, very quickly um, and also disconnect them really quickly, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and we really started from both creating these large scale interactive installations um, and having this prototype driven design effort. We like to learn through making um, and just make stuff as quickly as possible um, and hope it's not terrible. If it's not, we use it. If it is, we just throw it away and make something else. Um, so Space Brew started, I'll talk over this video. Um, it started from a project called Plug and Play that we did as a commission for Zero One in San Jose in 2008. Um, and they asked us to project in a building, and we said, sure. Um, and we didn't know what we were going to do, but then we had this idea of using the civic space. So it was actually City Hall in San Jose um, and creating um, different interactive stations that people could uh, plug into um, and then patch into this projection. So when you yell into a megaphone or when you jump on hopscotch, when you sit at a picnic table, um, or when you post to Twitter, uh, Flickr, or Foursquare, um, or when um, I think traffic goes by as well. I try to remember them all. Um, it creates one of these interactive blocks and they all combine into one large projection. Um, and so we built this elaborate system to make all these things happen. We used Arduino, we used XB, we used camera sensing. Um, we had a lot of different scripts running and scraping Twitter and Flickr and things like that. Um, and it was a nightmare to make all these things talk to each other. Um, and everyone was just like, oh, it's great, this fun thing. And I was like, it was so terrible. But it was great <laughs> when it actually happened. Um, and we said, we, first of all, we need to make our lives easier. We need to make things that work this way that we can really quickly patch these things all together. Um, and we want other people to make this kind of work. Like, we don't want to be the only people projecting on buildings. We don't want to be the only people creating um, interactive spaces. Um, and so we created Space Brew out of this to make these things happen. Um, and this is our, um, I love making these slides like a million videos. This is a few things that people have made with it, um, especially um, and made with Arduino as well. So a lot of people are use it to um, connect different spaces together. So what actually happens is um, not only can you connect interactive inputs and outputs, you can connect them over the internet. Um, and so this is, for example, a remote presence tool where you can play with your cat 
from your office. You can pretend you're in this meeting, but really you're doing something much more important, um, playing with your cat. Um, but um, and people use it for a lot of different types of projects. This is a beautiful art piece from um, the Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design, where you can kind of um, understand someone's approach upstairs through these um, stepper motors that make this kind of interactive sound installation. Um, and we're also working right now with the design technology program at the new school. Um, and here are a couple of interactive uh, projects from that where you can water a flower and water someone else's flower over the internet. Or when you are out of your beer, someone can finally know about that across the space and bring you a new one, um, trying to solve the most important problems um, in the world. And so what actually is happening behind the scenes here is we have space beer running. It's a script that runs on a server. Um, and then we have clients. Um, and so a client can be on an Arduino. It can be on the internet. It can be in open frameworks. Um, it can be in some toolkit we haven't imagined yet, but it'll, it'll work hopefully as well. Um, and when it connects, it says, these are the kind of things I can talk about, and these are the kind of things that I can listen to. And Space Brew can help you build logical relationships between those two. And so if you have a thing where, say, this is um, you know, the volume of my phone, um, and this is an LED, and this LED says, well, I can listen to R, G, and B and change colors. Space where I can patch those two things together and say, now, if I want the volume of my phone to control a color, um, all I do is actually go to this web interface, which we'll show you in a second, and patch those two things together. So um, just as a quick technical detail, that thing is all happening over WebSocket. So anything that can connect to a network via WebSockets um, and is formatted in JSON. We're working on some more protocols, but that's how it works at the moment. Um, and this is the sort of switchboard I was talking about. So um, when everything connects, um, it shows up in this, <laughs> this beautiful online tool. Um, and you can see we're actually patching these things together. So each sort of line here is a different client. And maybe it's an input, maybe it's an output. We can kind of look at this list and see what's happening. Um, and then the server says, OK, um, let's, let's patch these two things together. These th two things can talk to each other. And once you make all these relationships, suddenly you have an interactive installation. It's just that easy, finally. Um, and um, one of the big pieces we have right now is this way to make these things talk to each other. How do you know that the volume can control an LED, but it can't control you know, the switch in, in this room to turn the lights on and off? Um, we have three different built-in types that are Boolean, range, and string. Um, and what they do is uh, make easily um, or make it easier to automatically route these things together. So you can say true or false or on and off range for a number, and string for text. So this could be Twitter. This could be, again, volume, and then a switch. Um, and we really, um, we do. So when we built that plug and play project, we made stuff in every single toolkit you could imagine, because some things are better than others at doing different things. It's much easier, obviously, to prototype um, in physical space with Arduino, and then, but I wanted to make some high-res projection graphics, so we used open frameworks. So we've created different libraries um, for every toolkit we can think of at the moment um, to allow Space Brew to patch these two things together um, and let um, these toolkits do, um, do what they're good at, basically. Um, and so you know, when I want something in the web, I use JavaScript. When I want different types of projection, I use open frameworks, and so on and so forth. Um, and so some people might be wondering why. I hope I've answered that a little bit. But um, that is the main thing is you know, creating this way to glue all these parts together. Um, and we had this big focus at the start, real-time communication, letting things happen very, very fast. So when I jump on a hopscotch, I immediately see this projection, this explosion happening. Um, and then the main thing we want to talk about is that this idea of the low floor and high ceiling. So all of these libraries are ready for you. And once you start off, you're already in the network. You're already ready to connect to someone else and interact, interact with someone else. And so you can have prototypes really, really quickly happen. Um, cool, I'm trying to pat. I just, <laughs> sorry, I can just ramble, and Julia's just like, rah. Um, but, um, but yeah, and I'll let Julia talk about Space Brew and Arduino a little bit. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, we use Ar Arduino is one of the, the core technologies that we've been using with Space Brew since the beginning, uh, which is even why when, you, when we have the Space Brew range, that's a range is actually just a 10 bit value, like an Arduino analog value. Uh, from an uh, Arduino sensor. So primarily the way we had first connected Arduinos to Space Brew was just through processing. Um, 
So for the first six months we were using Space Brew, all of our Arduino examples and anytime we wanted to connect to the physical world, we had to have the Arduino connected to a computer and we would have you know, that connected to processing via serial port and then have processing actually do the communication with the Space Brew server. But a lot has evolved since then. Uh, now we actually have a Yoon library and an Ethernet library. Uh, their Ethernet library works both with an Ethernet Arduino or with an Arduino with an Ethernet shield. And uh, it's pretty robust, uh, you know, it works pretty well. The Yoon library is, is a newer library. It does work quite well as well. Uh, we do sometimes, we're still debugging it a little bit just because we don't have as many users using that library. So we're still, you know, they're still finding some bugs in that and kind of working to resolve them. I actually was encountering one earlier today when I was uh, doing some demos out there. And, and so what we, today we have a bunch of Arduino demos actually set up just outside this room. So um, later on what we suggest is if you want to come over, we can definitely show you a few examples of um, you know, Arduino's connected to space route to control lights, control printers, and, um, you know, but again, the, the demos that we have out there are just really kind of simple demos, just kind of showing something not in context. I think the real kind of magic using space route is when you're kind of really kind of embed this into more of an interactive installation where, you know, it's, it's technology is hidden and it's really about your experience. Um, and space route is just kind of the glue behind the scenes that helps helping you kind of join all these disparate parts um, mm -hmm. and choreograph them. Yeah, and so what we have right now is a set um, for all these different frameworks, different libraries to kind of get up and running. Um, and then our, our website, which should be on more slides, is, is spacebrew.cc. Um, and if you go there, you'll see we're, we're building up our kind of tutorials and examples. But what we want to have is, is a lot of these sort of small parts that you can start a project with. So you know, you'll see out there we have an LED bar that just changes color. Um, but that can go to represent a lot of different types of uh, outputs. Um, and if we have this thing where we can build up these different examples of inputs and outputs and have the way to connect them and build a relationship to, um, with each other, we're trying to build this community of all these different uh, pieces that people can kind of build interactive installations from. So that's kind of our, our roadmap at the moment is, you know, A, obviously doing a lot more testing and things like that, but B, trying to build up this sort of cookbook of examples and say, okay, what can you actually make with Space Brew? What is the bare bones of an interactive installation? And how can we make this sort of toolkit for people to use? to really quickly get up and running um, and prototype and, and move things um, back and forth. Um, and, be, and before we get to questions, the only thing I want to say is, I mean, Space Brew is an open source project. Uh, right now, it's really just kind of kept by a bunch of us who kind of do this outside of work. I mean, we, we might use it a little bit in projects that we do at work, but primarily it's like a project that we do as a passion project after hours. It was born at the Rocco Group uh, at a point in time that we could devote actual work hours to it, which is a very a nice luxury to have for an open source project. But at this point, you know, there's a few of us here in New York, a few of us uh, out in the West Coast, and then there's some people spattered, some in Europe, that, uh, you know, do projects with it and, and you know, contribute uh, back to it. So, I mean, if anybody's interested in using Space Brew, um, again, it's totally open source. You can kind of take the code, do whatever you want with it, use however you want with it. Well, what we just ask is if you build something cool, uh, that you'd be willing to, to, you know, see what you can kind of give back to the community so that other people can continue to build cool stuff with it. Is it, uh, I'll switch um, to questions. <laughs> <laughs> is it limited to, um, like, like one to one, or can you no. shape, like multiple, uh, multiple mm -hmm. ends and like, you can connect multiple that, to multiple. You know, like, do, like, do some logic based on those things. That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's very much um, it's very much up to you. Let me I, I'll pull up the admin interface a little bit bigger so people can see it. Um, but this is really what it looks like, um, and you can see all the things that we actually have out there. And so, really, you patch. You can do a one to one, and you can actually route to yourself, which is what's happening right here. Um, but you can make as many connections as you want, um, and you can also um, do this via the command line if that's your style. Um, but um, basically, uh, yeah, you can create as many sort of relationships as you want. Um, and right now, we actually have, so this is running, um, so that the server runs, so um, it can run either on your computer or over the internet. And right now, we have a uh, free, sort of slow, but sort of fast um, one running that people can prototype with called uh, sandbox.spacer.cc. So all the examples you'll see online, you can connect to immediately um, and prototype your own stuff over the internet. And then we have tutorials about how to set up your own server uh, to run over the internet or run on your computer. Um, and so this is what's happening live right now. So it's a mix of our students' projects and the things that are running um, out in the main space at the moment. Do you guys have any other questions? I, I know we went through that very quickly, but um, 
we, we can show you. Uh, do you want to show you a quick thing? I think it's better to We'll do it out there. Just kidding, guys. We have a bunch of stuff over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but it's, um, yeah. That's about it. Any, any other questions in general? All right. Thank you. Cool. Here, we'll show you this as the keep in touch slide is very important. Um, yeah, it's very small, but space at CC, um, and you can follow Julio and I on the internet and all that stuff. And then we have a Tumblr of student work at MFA. It's a very, very long. MFADT-spacer.tumblr.com is the current student project. Um, we're working on, if you go follow the blog at spacer.cc, um, we're working on putting together more kind of hackathons where people get together, make some stuff with Space Brew. Um, we're there just in case you were to ever have a problem, which who knows if that could happen. But, um, yeah. but yeah. Anthony? Uh, I'm curious about where like, Space Brew and Tembu kind of overlap in terms of like the connectivity because there seem to be some things that are kind of in common and I'm wondering about if you imagine in your own way like how you might bridge those two projects into one very powerful I mean it's powerful already but something that would just be like you know we were 100% hoping someone asked that question so so first of all we love Tembu and we actually use uh, Tembu all the time um, and um, and it's really exciting because for us, we're trying to build a more general um, toolkit that's very much focused on real-time data and very, very generic. Um, and so we use Tembu, and we have a bunch of examples um, of using Tembu to, to bring that data into SpaceBrew. So you know, for us, Tembu is the same as um, you know, if you build something that's like a mic, for example. So I say I want to build an application that connects to a microphone and sends that sound level to SpaceBrew. Um, we say, okay, instead we're building an application that connects to this range of APIs and sends that data as text or as a number or as a true or false, whether or not you know, there's a new tweet or something like that. And so it's this way to bring this huge world of input data and then space will let you connect it to a physical output or a projection output and all these different types of ways. So, um, so yeah, we use Tembu all the time. Um, and there's a, there's a good example on, online that Julio has as well. So is, is Spacebrew basically saying, I create like a data primitive and give it to me, and then I will figure out how to route it. It's sort of a router for these primitives. I didn't see any kind of application logic in, inside. Maybe things went by fast, or maybe I missed that, or maybe it isn't. There no, it, it, there. it very it's intentionally not there. Right. So um, it very much is a router, um, and it, it should mention as well. I mean, we have those three basic types, um, but it's just JSON, and so we supply custom types as well. So you can say you, any. Um, you just give it a name, and you say, oh, I'm, I'm sending person. And that's a size and, and a position. And you can pack a larger uh, data object rather than just those sort of primitives. So I, but, so I can either throw a primitive or an object mm -hmm. into the system. And then it's space for its job to say where that primitive or object goes. Translate it, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and the one thing it doesn't do it is it doesn't do, like, of course, if you're doing a custom type, it will only let you send that data to another app that accepts that same custom type. So if I'm right. sending create, I say this app can provide data and in in, can publish data of type person and another app can subscribe to data of type per person, SpaceBrew will link those two, but it's not gonna check whether that data is really of type person. It will never know what a data of type person is. It just, right. it will just allow you to link two apps that say that they can deal with of that data type person. Right. Like, it's not doing like aggregations or transformations, right? No, right. it's Taking not. It and pass it. If you wanted to yeah. do that kind of thing, you'd have to like actually do it in a way where you kind of like pass it to one app that does some processing and then sends that process data out. Like we're we're trying to keep the, the server as bare bones as right. possible. And we've had conversations: should we have some level of of ability to transform even like just very simple things like numbers, um, you know, flows to ints or like like process even at that very basic level? And at this point, we decided against it. It's a slope. Uh, yeah, it is. That's. <laughs> Plus, people have done a good job at making like those kind of services where it takes an input and then spits it out as something else, or you know, translates it or multiplies it, and and it's really quick to make those kind of things. And then so if you have it in this sort of space brew realm, you can build that translation up and you can swap it up for different things too. So if you have this sort of filter model that you have one thing publishing something and then you just swap out whatever that filter is because you can just patch and reroute those things whenever you want. So very much a, a patch panel. Yeah. Yeah. We could have called it cash pay, except for <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and we're real time, real time. Real time. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Is this this is a pub sub, right? A pub, a pub yeah. Sub? Yep. Okay. So, is it similar to the MQTT? Is that is it similar to the uh, 
it's an open source platform also. Uh, messaging you to what the name is something. I don't know. I don't know that platform site. So okay. I mean, but if, um, so, if. All right, let me ask the question differently. Okay, so this pops up. All right, so you have a server that mm -hmm. is going to support um, requests coming in. Okay, so for each client that wants to publish that I have, you know, this available, this information, right? So it's going to go to the broker, mm -hmm. which is essentially sitting on your server. Yep. So each client would also have to link that library, right? They have to be compatible. Correct. Yep. So, so right now it's it's a separate um, a separate piece that you bundle into your application. So if it's in JavaScript, it's just an external piece that you include, um, and then um, all that logic is handled for you. So you just tell the library, okay, these are the types I publish and the names of the different pieces. Have it already for the Arduino as well. That's kind of also what I'm getting at. So the yes. Arduino client, you would be able to link that in. Yep, yep, so it's two, and that's the different ways. So um, for, and there's two different ways, or th three different ways, as Julia said it. So there's one that you can do with the Ethernet library, um, and that just sort of builds logic on top of the Ethernet library, um, or you can do it directly with the Arduino Yoon as well. And so, um, I mean, I think the only limitation with it, with most Arduinos is more like if, if you're trying to do something very text heavy, as you know, if Arduinos are not great for doing a lot of text processing. But uh, but yeah, with the Ethernet library and with the Yun library, yeah, like you can. You might essentially shoot over commands back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely do that. Uh, yeah, definitely. And, and, and look at the Ethernet and the, and the uh, Yun libraries are the two quickest way where without like connecting a computer at all, just having a standalone Arduino connected to the uh, to a network, uh, being able to kind of connect space bro. And, and, and QTT is a, it's a protocol, not a platform. Oh, so, okay. so, so it's, it's a way of it's a it's a standardized method of communication, but it does but not accomplish anything itself. But yeah. there are implementations. Oh, okay. there are lots of, yeah, there's lots of implementations. Yeah, so it's it's being used a lot of in the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. uh, which are much less real time oriented mm -hmm. than than what's going on here. Yeah, so use it for real time. Anyway, and, just want to make and in that case, I mean, really, like WebSockets is, is what we're using as our protocol. So that, that's the sort of, instead of MQTT, WebSockets is the piece that we're built off of, basically. Uh, yeah, we're going to kind of, like WebSocket is like TCP, like this, like it's Right, right, that's another way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's another MQTT level of abstraction. MQTT is there. a set of standards, like, um, you remember the old, like, uh, example based form standards, you know, packages of everything, yeah. you yeah. send it, and then, uh, again, subscription and, uh, whatever, uh, function, function uh, model, and then it's a data by you can actually pop everything inside it and get it. Okay. So based on standards. It's a protocol. Okay. And you website. Like protocol sketch right there. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're as lightweight than MQTT. We're trying to be as lightweight as humanly possible without breaking anything. But. And what your focus is real time, mm -hmm. what kind of throughput do you have? Like, <laughs> that's it's a common question, and we we don't have a real benchmark yet because I mean a lot of it depends on on how you're running it. You know, I mean our our target is always trying to send a particle system at 60 frames per second. So if we say like a thousand floats or more at 60 frames per second is our dream. Um, and so running on a local server, um, you can get pretty close to that. Um, and um, and you, really, we, we've gotten very, very close to that running locally. If you're running over the internet, there's a lot of variables there. you know. Um, and so that's the main piece. It depends how fast your cloud server is and how fast your internet is and things like that. Um, for sending most of the data, um, it's very, very, very fast because we're sending such small packets. You know, It's just JSON. Um, and we're looking at the, I mean, WebSocket supports binary as well. And so that would be, um, that's the kind of goal for this year is, is supporting that to make things a little bit faster. Um, but um, but yeah, if you're running on your own computer, then and you have the gigabit Ethernet set up, you can get pretty fast. Just one question: I believe it's like you use the TCP uh, for the websites, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to UDP? Because a low latency systems, you know, they usually use the UDP uh, protocol instead of the TCP protocol. And as I see, this is an art, you know, art kind of project. The data, I mean, if I use the data, it's not that critical. So UDP, UDP doesn't have like that much lag. Right. Have tried it. We've done we've done separate systems. We never tried to, to run space for on UDP basically, but um, you know we've used UDP. We we did one piece that we were syncing uh, 180 laptops together as a sync and syncing a particle system. And in that case, we were not worried about if we miss one frame or something like that. And, and I think but also, I mean, we, we the primary use of space for was really as a prototyping tool. I mean, I think we've used it in a few production environments, and we'd like to use it more. 
but so like being able to really quickly and easily be able to link stuff. I mean, if um, which is why we selected WebSockets because then it, it allowed us to just kind of have a bunch of different type of platforms or, or, or frameworks that we could link together really quickly and link and unlink. Uh, but we do find that sometimes when we are kind of getting ready to do that final installation, like we'll build the initial proof of concept, great, we test some interaction things, great, but then when we're scaling it, sometimes we need to find a more customized solution like UDP or, or some other kind of way to link things so that they provide the performance that we want at the final installation. I mean, in a dream world, we wouldn't have to, we would do it all space route, but to be honest, like, yeah, that's uh, what we're building towards is the dream, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Cool. All right. If you have more questions, we love answering questions. All right. Cool. Well, we're right around the corner. If you guys want to see demos and have more specific questions, please yeah, feel free. Thank, thank you.
but Jody is going to be here in the comic one. And when I looked in here, I saw you here, I said, is Jody the one that has the last Jody is a dear friend and one of the first physical computing teachers at ITP. Uh, she's now on faculty at BMCC, and she is also a very talented uh, artist in many different media. One of those media happens to be comic books, um, and what she's done a really great job of the last uh, couple of years is writing instructional material for her classes and for the rest of the world using comics. Um, it's a really interesting and novel approach to writing instruction and teaching around technology because we're so used to seeing stuff that's kind of dry and boring and her stuff is just gorgeous. You want to keep reading it so you can learn more from it. Also, she happens to be a brilliant artist. So. Well, thank Good. you very much, Tom. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I think Tom is uh, exaggerating my um, comics uh, you know, uh, expertise. But um, what um, I'd like to talk about today is just a little bit about using comics to teach technology, different approaches I've used. There's sort of a history of this too. You know, people, I'm not certainly the first person to do this. And I want to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, some of the people who've used comics to um, uh, explain technical processes, science, you know, concepts, and whatever. Um, you know, this is a definition of comics from um, Scott McCloud, uh, his book, Understanding Comics, that, you know, came out back in 1993. Uh, his definition of comics, I like to kind of, you know, cut it down to this, images and sequence to convey information. I mean, that's the part of comics that I'm really interested in, um, you know, in terms of um, using it with technology. You know, there's lots of other images and sequences that, you know, convey information. Um, you know, the airline safety card, which is obviously not a comic. And of course, you know, um, mysterious, uh, enigmatic, um, you know, handouts you get when you buy something from Ikea that are <laughs> really confusing. But this does have, like, word balloons. Um, Back in 1951, um, Will Eisner, who was kind of an early pioneer of comics in like many, many ways, um, he started a company called American Visuals Corporation that was um, uh, designed to like use comics to convey information. You know, um, his first big project was uh, Preventative Maintenance Monthly, that you know kind of came out of his experience. Um, working in the military in uh, World War II. Um, this uh, magazine explained how to do all different kinds of maintenance procedures and um, things from like how to start a stalled engine to um, you know taking apart a cook stove and cleaning it and guns and whatever. He used a lot of different techniques like he had this character Joe Dope so he used straight up comics you know, kind of strong narration, you know, uh, characters you might identify with. Um, but he also used photographs, he used like diagrams, and it's got like a lot of text, you know, as well. Um, it wasn't all images. Um, kind of jumping forward a little bit, this is, I'm kind of jumping all over the place with this. Um, Larry Gonick started in the 70s doing cartoon guides to sort of just about everything. He did one for genetics, he did it for physics, he did it for uh, 
I think uh, statistics, I believe, too. Um, and he also did a, um, a strip in uh, Discover Magazine um, about different mathematical and scientific concepts. This one's about neural networks. And uh, this is a little bit off track, but not totally. Um, in uh, 1999, um, Ira Glass of This American Life did a comic with um, cartoonist Jessica Abel that was, how do you do a radio show? You know, it had all the technical information, you know, about where you put the mic, blah, blah, blah. And um, I think probably you guys may all be familiar with How Tunes, um, which uh, started in, I believe, 2004. Um, uh, they, um, you know, this was sort of a team of uh, scientists and cartoonists, and I think Ingrid Dugota is actually a uh, toy designer. Um, they are kind of how to's for kids. Um, they're projects based on uh, science and um, engineering concepts. Uh, their uh, projects have been, uh, they're on Instructables. They were also in Make for a long time, and um, they've been collected into books. Uh, the projects are all based on things that you'd have lying around the house. So if you were a kid, you know, you could like make this project or learn this concept with whatever, you know, you might have lying around. And um, this is a project uh, done by um, Adafruit, uh, Lee Moore Freed and um, Lady Ada, and uh, Philip Taroni did it in 2008. It's a, um, a comic called Citizen Engineer. This particular one was about SIM card hacking. I think, I get the feeling this may have been an idea to do a comic uh, based on a bunch of kits that they sell at Adafruit. I'm not sure how many they did. Comics like sort of take forever, you know, so I think oftentimes people have these ideas and sometimes maybe they do one, you know, but, but it, it's, it breaks it down. I thought it was nice how they broke down the process. You know, you, you got it when you bought the kit, but it's also available, you know, online. And Scott McCloud uh, did this comic that Google Chrome used, or Google used to introduce the Chrome browser back in 2008. Um, it's, it, he used, uh, it, it really explained the processes of a modern browser and multi-threading and all this stuff. Um, really, uh, he didn't write it, but um, he kind of used metaphors and analogies to really explain how a browser worked. Um, kind of different than Will Eisner, who really, you know, kind of walked you through everything with a character. And this is just another um, project. Uh, there's the series of manga guides to many, many, many different science and mathematical concepts. They were, you know, written in Japan, and um, No Starch Press uh, publishes them here. This one's the one to uh, manga guide to electricity. Um, some of you guys might be familiar with this comic. This is like an eight-page um, uh, comic that uh, was created in 2011. Um, Soldering is easy. It's got a Creative Commons license. It's, it really kind of breaks down soldering with, you know, images, very simple. Uh, it's all black and white and text, um, you know, to kind of get you started with understanding how to, you know, how to solder. And uh, this is another Adafruit project. E is for electronics. It's a coloring book, you know, um, the ABCs of electronics. And now we're getting to me. Um, uh, you know, I think comics are really perfect for explaining technology because um, the way the words underline the meaning of the pictures and the pictures underline the meaning of the words is really unique and I think you can show stuff a couple different ways so it helps people particularly kind of like what we call visual learners you know um, it, it's I think it's just helpful this is I kind of became a little bit obsessed with comics because um, my uh, husband writes about the publishing industry and I go to a lot of comic book conventions and I thought, wow, you know, I can use comics to explain binary notation, which I find really, really interesting, but my students used to look at me like eyes glazed over, like totally, you know? 
So I was trying to figure out a visual way of explaining this. Um, and it's also a sequential way of, ex of, of explaining it. Um, and this was like my first attempt at a comic. Uh, and um, then I did a comic about Arduino. Um, you know, I, like Tom said, I taught physical computing here and I, you know, went to ITP um, and did a lot of physical computing when I was here. Um, because I was a sculptor, it made a lot of sense for me. And um, uh, what I learned on was the basic stamp. Uh, you know, some of you may remember that. Um, the basic stamp, I, I also used to program um, uh, pick chips and you know BX24 and um, when I came and I'd sort of gotten away a little bit from physical computing I had bought an Arduino and fooled around with it a little bit but by 2010 when I started really using it again you know the platform was super robust and it was great and I was so happy to uh, think I would never have to buy another basic stamp again or whatever um, that I thought, you know, this would be great. Somebody should do a comic about Arduino. And I thought, oh, I guess I'll do a comic about Arduino. Um, I wanted to make it very um, clear about certain issue, you know, certain concepts uh, that were basic to, um, you know, doing physical computing. Um, and I really tried to boil it down. You know, the first thing I wanted to boil down was the language because I've said, oh yeah, I'm working on an open source electronics prototyping platform, and I see everybody, you know, like people go, you know, probably not the people in this room, but a lot of other people, you put them off immediately just with the language. So I was like, let's break down the language, because once you break it down, it's not hard to understand at all. And um, I also talked, you know, I wanted to do a little bit about, a um, little bit of basic electronics theory, you know, what's Ohm's law, you know, uh, voltage, current, resistance, you know, because I think it's important to understand those concepts. Um, and uh, I'm not going to show the whole comic, I just have a few things. I talked about inputs and outputs, you know, um, and also another important thing that you always talk about with physical computing is, you know, difference between analog and digital information, you know. So I kind of went over all that stuff first and then, you know, walked you through downloading the IDE and setting up you know, uh, getting ready to program, and of course, you know, how to do the wiring, you know. <clears throat> and I did basic digital and analog circuits. Actually, when I thought I, when I started doing this, I thought it would be about five pages, you know, and it turned out to be like 15, you know. And I still think probably there's some stuff I could have uh, explained a little bit more. Um, you know, working with, uh, when I did this comic, Tom was very supportive of this comic. He was great. And uh, it got a lot of attention, um, which was great, because he put it on the Arduino site. And from there, it went on quite a few uh, technology sites. Um, and it's been translated into about 10 languages. Um, uh, you know, I did it as a Creative Commons project, because I really wanted, I really saw it as a project to sort of give to the Arduino world, you know. Um, uh, as a result of this, I, um, uh, Tom, also through Tom, I met uh, some of the people from um, Maker Media, and um, I uh, worked on a project with um, Gareth Branwin, who was then the editorial director of Make, uh, for a um, breadboarding workshop, which they were sort of prototyping at World Maker Fair in 2012. And um, I did a couple kind of one-page comics. It's a lot of information on this comic. Um, which is, uh, you know, how to use a breadboard. And then we also did a page that was like a step-by-step, -step, um, you know, how to build a particular circuit, which was the circuit that they were, you know, using as part of this, um, uh, this, this uh, workshop. And I also, I, I thought it would be helpful too to just have, you know, the schematic with like a real annotation of what the board actually looks like. Because I think for beginners, that jump between schematic and board is not always so obvious, you know. Um, I'm can, now I'm still, I'm working with Make still on um, a manual for, uh, they're doing a, a, a kit that has, will have 10 different analog circuits. Um, you know, that are meant to help you learn how to use a breadboard. 
And uh, this is the second iteration. I think it's more clear. But um, I'm working with Sean uh, Reagan from uh, Make, who's done a lot of the writing for this. And um, it has sort of an introduction just to how to use a breadboard. And uh, it also has, for the circuits, you know, part list. Uh, and um, for many of them, really a step-by-step -step layout that shows both how the board develops and also how the uh, schematic changes. You know, and then what it looks like at the end. Oh, it's got a glossary too, you know. I think you can never give people too much information. Um, you know, I, I teach a lot of web development, you know, introductory web programming, web programming, a little, you know, using APIs and stuff. And um, this is something I'm working on myself. I, I want to do kind of an HTML5 three-part thing, you know, basic HTML, CSS, uh, and JavaScript, you know, um, and kind of pull them all together. Again, I think uh, for me, um, you know, I always want to write all over my students' code, but of course I can't because it's on the screen. But I can write all over my comics to explain, you know, why you put this there and whatever. It's, you know, you can give them the code, but you can also give them a lot more information visually. Um, I also think comics are great for documentation, you know, um, you know, as makers and people who build stuff, you know, we're always documenting everything, you know, um, blogs and um, uh, photographs, and I think it makes it really powerful to put them into a narrative form of some type. Um, drawing every single thing you did might be, you know, like a little bit time consuming, but um, I think you can take the pictures you've got and put them into a narrative form. Um, this is something I worked on that um, uh, ITP has a uh, open source uh, laser cutter here that started as a project for ITP summer camp uh, in 2012. And you know, I worked on that project and it kind of got uh, sort of finished it off more or less with um, Eric Hagen, who really kind of took it over, who was a um, resident researcher at the time. Um, but I decided uh, the, the project was started by a couple of ITP grads. The Laser Soar itself is an open source project that they was originally a Kickstarter project. Uh, A.D. Wagenicht and um, Stefan Hecken, Heckenberger. Um, and, um, you know, I took my pictures and just sort of put them into a narrative form, you know. Um, so instead of having endless blog posts, you know, I try to turn it into a story of some type, you know. Um, you know, they, comics with photos are kind of classically called, you know, fumettis. Um, just one last thing, you know, um, I use Adobe Illustrator mostly, I use the Adobe Creative Suite, you know, I'm used to Illustrator, you know, and um, like I like using Vector, it's great, but uh, there's lots of free stuff out there. This is maybe you guys all know this, um, but I do think it's great to know what the open source tools are out there, software for making graphics. Uh, Inkscape is a great um, open source uh, vector program and um, free, uh, very lively community of active users, so it keeps getting better. And uh, GIMP is kind of like open source Photoshop, you know, um, uh, same thing, you know, lots of users, keeps getting better. This isn't open source. Um, this is uh, Comic Life, which I think costs about 30 bucks. It's, um, I love drawing my little rectangles, you know, in Illustrator, but not everybody really wants to do that. Um, Comic Life uh, comes with all kinds of templates and stuff like that. So if you don't want to draw your own word balloons and rectangles and whatever, it also integrates, particularly if you're thinking of doing something like a Fumetti, you know, the photo comic, um, it integrates very nicely with iPhoto. And, uh, oh, Fritzing is also, I think, a great tool. I mean, obviously, it's a great tool for um, working out your circuits and switching from your breadboard view to your schematic view and all that. But it's also, I think, a great tool because you can output images, you know, so you could really show how you're building a circuit, you know, sequentially without having to draw, 
you know, all those little, you know, um, holes in the, um, in the breadboard. And I think that's about it. You know, I put a bunch of links here. Um, I, I uh, you know, I put a bunch of links, both, you know, for comics um, and also for, um, you know, software and also a little bit about comics and education. Um, obviously, this isn't too helpful for you unless you're taking the pictures now, but I will put it on my site. It's a little bit fat. Uh, I've got to get the size down of the presentation. Um, and I'll put a blog post. And uh, I, I have put it on, um, whoops, on um, Google Docs now, if you can. I guess that was a little small. So now I've run through my presentation. <sighs> Questions? Is Comic Life free? No, it's not. It's not. Comic Life cost, it's cost $29. It's the one, you know. What? It's not that expensive, okay. No, it's, it's pretty cheap, but I mean, it would be nice if it were free, you know, um, but it's not, you know. Yes? Um, where could you find the, uh, the Arduino comic? Oh, it's on my site. Um, you know, let me, I think I, mm. It actually shows up when you do a Google search. Yeah, if you do a Google search for Jody Culkin, like, this was my moment of fame, so <laughs> it comes up really fast, you know, so. And it, it's been, actually, it's been great. It's been used by um, lots, of, lots of schools and lots of uh, hacker spaces and stuff. And, um, you know, I love seeing it in Greek. It makes me really happy. Yeah. Any other <coughs> questions? Oh, I guess that's it. Thank you guys all so much. Thank you for
So folks, uh, next up on the list, we've got Raquel Hussain. Ra Raquel is uh, showing us a project that she built that is um, a device for the detection of epilepsy uh, that uses Arduino as a controller in it. Um, and she's also going to talk a little bit about how it led to her understanding of how to do this. So take it away, Raquel. Uh, yes. Uh, just a slight correction. I built my own circuit board. Uh, I didn't use Arduino as my controller, but um, without Arduino, I wouldn't be where I'm at. So, so the title of my project is Application of a Wireless Electrical Device for the Detection of Epilepsy. But before I get into my project, I'll talk a little bit about myself. So, a little bit about me. I currently work at the Brooklyn College Community Partnership uh, at Brooklyn College, where I'm planning to expand their science program. And uh, in doing so, I hope to introduce Arduino to more students, high school students, middle school students. Uh, I also work at the Translational Neuroengineering Lab, where I performed my research. And it's at the Polytechnic Institute of NYU, which I uh, actually had the logo in the beginning. Um, and beyond that, I would like to become a professor. Uh, because I have a passion for teaching and I really want to help the next generation of scientists, engineers. So one of my dream goals is to uh, become a professor and run a lab and to have high school students, undergrads, graduate students, PhD students, fellows, all working together collaboratively on research so we can build a better future for ourselves. Oh, and the picture, uh, one of my favorite pictures, I uh, was a chess champion when I was younger, and this is just one picture that just stood out with me. I love chess and I love cats too, so, yes. So, while I was in the lab, and this was back in June time, June of 2013, I was sitting in my lab meeting, and I was reading this paper, uh, so, uh, somebody was presenting on it. This company called NeuroVista, they did a study where they used an implantable device to detect pre-seizure states. And what they did was they did a brain surgery, they put the device in, and whenever there was a pre-seizure state, somebody, a person would be alerted through a beeping light. And it worked. This was the first study that proved that epilepsy detection could be done internally. However, See, I, I like to be new, so it, I decided to ask the question, is it possible for me to do what NeuroVista did? Is it possible for me to detect these pre-seizure states using an external device? So the idea is novel because it's the first attempt at doing an external detection for seizures. So in June, I started writing my research plan. And in July, I began doing my research, uh, at least rather the building of my circuit boards. Um, I began building this device using two programs. I started with Allegro and at Altium. Um, they're both circuit board um, builders. Um, so on the circuit board, there's, and I know it's a little, it's not so big, but on the circuit board, there are four main component systems. The first is the biosignal acquisition. The second, the analog to digital conversion. The third, and I put this a little out of order, the power regulation. And the fourth is the Bluetooth connectivity. The biosignal acquisition basically means getting our neural signals from our head to the circuit board. So how can we get these raw signals? We use electrodes, EEG electrodes. So working, I worked with two universities other than Poly. I worked with RWTH Aachen in Germany and University of Chicago to design a fashionable EEG cap um, that can just be put on, the circuit board placed in, and it's everyday use. And so what it does is the electrode takes up this neural information, these neural EEG waves, and that information goes through the, the wires onto this board to these golden pins to the female end of the golden pins. And so that is my biosignal acquisition. Then it goes to the analog to digital chip that I have here. It changes that raw neural information 
into something graphable, something usable. And that raw neural information, which is now something graphable, is then sent to the Bluetooth connectivity device. However, and I can't neglect to say about the power regulation, power regulation is something very important when it comes to medical devices. Medical devices are need to be safe. So on the circuit board, there are three, meth three ways of actually uh, stopping the circuit board. Um, and doing debugging um, to testing whether there's enough voltage, whether there's too much voltage. So I took careful consideration when building the circuit board, especially for human use. Um, there are filtration systems, and there's also a uh, debug for researchers. And the final system is through the step-up regulator, uh, which is a part of the power regulation system, uh, which maintains the board at three volts. And in October, I have my final version, which is great. Um, the Bluetooth modulator, the Bluetooth modulation and everything, that um, works using a, a specific chip made by Panasonic. Panasonic uh, designed it, um, and I use it in my board. It works on Bluetooth 4.0, meaning that it's secure. And so we have all the information going to this Bluetooth chip. And then that information is then sent to an iOS application, which I also designed. The iOS application uh, was written in C++ and then C, uh, Objective-C, forgive me. Um, and I used uh, MATLAB to originally write my algorithms, and then I refined them further. So both of my algorithms, uh, which I name line length and high frequency oscillation, they uh, worked simultaneously to provide an accurate seizure prediction. So these algorithms are important in that they are the only way we can do this detection. So without proper working algorithms, we can't do these detections. Um, but beyond that, I had to learn. I had to learn how to use resistors, use capacitors, use all of these microcomponents, how they work together. I had to learn how to do that somewhere. I had to have a beginning. Every superhero scientist has to have a beginning. So my beginnings, yes, the backstory. Uh, my first experience with Arduino was last summer. In, during my junior year, I took a class in Arduino with the intention to teach middle school students. Now, that was great. However, what was bad about it was that uh, when teaching my middle school students, I actually had high school students enter, college students. So I was teaching all different levels of students. Um, and it was my first time ever teaching. So. It was my first time dealing with schematics, the schematic diagrams necessary to build circuit boards. It was my first time dealing with microcomponents, such as resistors, capacitors, inductors. I didn't know anything about those things other than the basic things that you learn in physics, you know, about farads and ohms. But I didn't see the actual application until I learned about Arduino. Without Arduino, I wouldn't have made it this far. I wouldn't have been able to do this project. I, I wouldn't have discovered my passion for the things I loved. I would have never discovered that I enjoy teaching. So beyond that, I also experienced frustration because I was so passionate about it. Now, this project would not have been possible without Arduino. In that, if I didn't learn about Arduino, I wouldn't have been able to make my device. Because I wouldn't have had the basis Arduino gave me. Arduino for me was Super Scientist 101. I, it was my crash course in how to do engineering, microengineering at that. Now, uh, the reason I made my presentation really short is because I know that a lot of people want to talk about the whole detection of epilepsy more, but my presentation was supposed to be an Arduino specifically. So I'm going to leave it up to the audience to ask me questions based on that. Yes? Uh, 
could you walk through like like a case study of the the epileptic person who is wearing your device and like you know what happens? Like what are the signals that they're picked up that are unique and how is it predicted? Can okay. Sort of um. Can I use the? Okay. Is there an eraser so I can just erase the? I'm just going to draw a basic um, EEG graph. Um, this is going to be one that involves a seizure. Our measurements are volts, in microvolts actually, over time, which will be in seconds. So we start with the basic EEG waves. Uh, those are heart waves, forgive me. We have basic waves, normal waves. Now, this is our normal set. Um, and again, this is just for explanation purposes that I'm doing it like this. And again, remember, normally EEG waves are actually very close together. So I've just ex pulled it out a bit so that you can see what these waves look like. When a person is in a pre-seizure state, they have a spike in these waves. So there's like a large spike, a large spike, a large spike, depending on who the patient is. Then what happens is that the spikes go back to normal for some time, for approximately about five minutes to an hour. That's the average. And then the person goes into their epileptic state. So that's generally how an EEG wave would work, essentially, the, at least the seizure waves. So the pre-seizure state occurs approximately five minutes to 60 minutes before a seizure. My prediction, so using, my, um, using the application I wrote, it can do predictions in about two minutes after, approximately two minutes after the pre-seizure state, after the state, approximately two minutes. I've tested this using MATLAB, uh, my algorithms, um, and about two minutes after the pre-seizure state. So that gives a person three minutes to 58 minutes to figure out what to do. So the point of the device is that it's therapeutic and diagnostic. Diagnostic in that it tells you that you're about to have a seizure, and then furthermore therapeutic in that the patient can take their medicine to mitigate it. And studies have shown that over time, if a patient takes their medicine before the seizure, the likelihood of seizures actually decreases. Um, the reason research into seizure detection is so important is because one out of 10 people in the world and one out of 26 Americans will have a seizure at some point in their life. Epilepsy is the third most common neurological disorder in the United States. Those are some pretty high statistics. Um, any other questions? Do you have a picture of the shower cap there or the cap? Um, I would show, but I because I'm working on a patent right now, just for the sake of keeping it. Um, but it's similar to EEG caps, but it is um, fa it's a fashionable cap. Essentially, it's like a knitted cap. Um, think of like a tight-fitting knitted cap. Yes. Um, any other questions? Did you uh, collaborate with a neurologist or somebody to do these studies, or did you just do your own research? Um, I worked with uh, the Polytechnic Institute of NYU, where I worked with the Department of Electrical Engineering. Um, and we also had, so we didn't test on people. That's the only thing. We didn't test on people, because that requires uh, a lot of paperwork. And uh, again, this project is very new in that I only finished the circuit board last year in October, October of 2013. Um, and the application, I'd been writing it up uh, over the time, so I didn't finish my application until about February. Um, what's also great about, um, and something I should mention um, in terms of validity for the research, um, the average packet drop rate, meaning uh, the amount of packets we get back so this is testing how viable the neural signal is. 
um, was 0.1% over 100 tests. So with 100 tests, and this is testing at different frequencies, different amplitudes, different distances, 0.1%. And we also included impedance tests as well, forgive me. So testing from 10 feet away from the device to 30 feet away from the device. The furthest we ever went was 30 feet, which is a, a pretty good distance. Just in case if you're not holding your phone, you want to go to the fridge, you want to use the bathroom. Yes. Uh, so two questions. The precursor. The pre state, yes. Whatever you call it. How many of them did it happen? Um, it depends on the individual. So, uh, but generally, it's a, it's about maybe four or five of them. Before they're uh, it's about four. Um, so they. Oh 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 oh! I thought you were talking about the spikes. Forgive no, me. I'm talking about how many times will you get a precursor a chance, before the right. actual? Uh, maybe mm, once or twice. Okay. Once or twice for that. What are you planning to do with all this? Uh, my res my research. Are you starting a company. <laughs> No, I actually would like to continue doing research. Um, I have future applications planned. One is specifically for communication purposes. So people who have amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, they, um, it would be a great way for people who are paralyzed to communicate. Um, it's using neural information again. Um, I was thinking about actually increasing the size of the circuit board and making a portable cap that researchers in hospitals can use. So it has a full set of electrodes in it. There's no wires. It's easy on, easy off. It'll reduce hospital wait times tremendously. So if somebody wanted to commercialize this, what would they have to do with you? <laughs> well, they'd have to give me their email and talk to me and you know work with me. Um, I mean, I'm very open. I put my email right there. And I'm pretty sure the half a million people, hello, everybody, out there have my email now. So you guys can feel free to email me whenever you want <laughs> uh, about you know my project. I would love to answer more questions. I mean, if you guys have any questions, um, just email me, and I'm available. I check my email every day. Um, any questions? I love questions. Uh, anything? Give me more questions. Yes? Whole system, the states. Yes. Um, again, approximately two minutes after um, the two minutes is the average time after the detect after the pre seizure state occurs that detection happens. So um, it's fairly sensitive, but it's not so sensitive that if you you know drop it, it will it'll break or it'll mess anything up. The circuit board is pretty sturdy as well as the cap. Right. Yeah. I understand. So um, in order to deal with that, that's why I use two algorithms. And I'm actually working on implementing a third algorithm within my program. The first algorithm checks to see if there's an abnormal behavior state. So if it's some abnormal spiking, it'll check for that. The second algorithm actually checks the amount of spikes within the abnormal set. That's what certifies whether it's a pre-seizure state. Because pre-seizure states follow a three to five spike pattern, generally. So if there's a three to five spike pattern, and these spike patterns follow the outline of what a pre-seizure state looks like, then we can certainly say that this person is in a pre seizure state. Yes? So you're sending this information to a server, I'm assuming, right? Because MATLAB is not going to fit on a chip. Oh, no, no, no. So um, I wrote my own iOS application, and the circuit board hooks up to the iOS application, and it sends it directly to the iOS application. Yes. So where is, Mat where is the algorithm processing taking place? Uh, on the, on the on application, iOS? on the iOS application itself. Um, the MATLAB um, testing that I did was um, only to make sure whether the algorithms worked, and then I implemented it within the application. Yes. Um, the cap is working on a battery. Yes. So um, the cap uh, works on the uh, well. It works this works from the battery of the circuit board, and what's interesting about it 
uh, because I really wanted to make it a low cost, highly efficient device. It runs on one AAA battery and it can run nearly two days on one AAA battery. How do you know batteries run out? How do you know when it's dropped out? So it'll send you an alert when you're back. So I programmed it so that it would send you an alert whenever the battery is too low. Because the, the circuit board itself needs three volts to run. So if there's ever a point where the circuit board runs below three volts, an uh, alert will be sent to the phone. So this is one of the uh, means of um, for helping the patient, keeping sa this is safe patient protocols, you know. So any malfunction in the chief will keep Yes. There'll be an alert on the, on the device that you're using. Uh, did you have a question? Yes. Um, so is your end goal to um, have the app that's like something that you can purchase or to have the cap that's something that you can purchase or are you looking to make it more um, like DIY so this is how you can um. protect your <laughs> I, for a project like this, DIY wouldn't be the best option because it's dealing with, act, with people and so it would be under the terms of medical devices. That's, that shouldn't be something that you DIY. But um, I would make it so that the cap is something that you can purchase. The application would be free. All the programming would be free. You can take it as you please. Um, just purchase the cap and put it on. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different ways. I was thinking uh, perhaps for DIY, one thing that could be done is you could program the circuit board yourself. So it would still have the EEG detection, but you can use that EEG information for other processes, which um, would be something cool for DIY. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Again, I love questions. So questions are great. Okay. So, yes. What other symptoms can these waves predict? Um, so, the, uh, I work specifically with epilepsy, but with, see, with um, any sort of conditions that involve EEG waves, we can write algorithms to detect them and then just use them with the application. So just implement the algorithm within the application. So um, I work specifically, again, with epilepsy, so uh, I would have to do more research into it uh, for different diseases uh, of neurological nature. Um, again, I would also like to work well with uh, ALS uh, communication. So the circuit board can be used in several different applications because it's essentially a wireless transmitter for biosignals. So, yes. um, oh, and something I should mention uh, before I have before I go, uh, I'm just a high school student. Yes, I'm a high school senior. Uh, I go to Midwood, um, yeah. I just thought it would be something interesting to mention afterwards. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you guys have any other questions or is that it? That's it? Um, if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'll be here outside if you want to talk to me privately or personally about anything. Uh, yes, thank you everybody. <laughs>
My algorithms, um, my objective C coding is actually different in that I wrote my own libraries for the objective C. Um, because objective C actually, you know, for iOS, um, they they don't have good Bluetooth 4.0 code. So I had to write my own libraries in order to use it. Of course, Apple's been giving me a big mess, you know, because you know when you write your own stuff. So they're, they're like perusing through all my stuff. Um, are you targeting a specific frequency range or is it just the entire range of frequencies? It's the entire range of frequency. Um, the reason being because depending on what type of seizures you have, they can be at different ranges. So, but every seizure state follows specific patterns. And that's what these algorithm checks. It checks the specific nutrients. Um, so, so I, um, yeah, so I report, so I use reported data. So, um, I took data, like I had drug resistant vocal seizures, parietal seizures, all occipital seizures, neocortical seizures, all different types of seizures, so that my detection system would be a good function. Um, I tested with as many seizure different data as I could get, as many as I could get. It's a lot of testing. Like I was sitting at my computer for like hours on like, testing, 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 running out Something that's interesting uh, that I'm uh, working on is checking deafness within babies. As babies, you know, they can't raise their hand. Like, raise your left hand, baby. No. So, to actually testing their neural information, it involves using two electrodes and something similar. Is a looping system. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to give you a hard opportunity. You know, I mean, this first spot is the best one. I think you have something that you can solve with me. Mark it, great. Thank you so much.
Uh, Gen Space here. For those of you who don't know Gen Space, 
Uh, Genspace is a biotech uh, enthusiast community center. I guess we could call it that. Yep. Uh, sometimes that. we call it a biohacker space. Um, community biotech lab also. Community biotech lab. That's, I'm going to go with that. Um, but they've been around for quite a while here. I'm going to steal my glasses too. Uh, in Brooklyn and doing some really amazing work around biotech education and biotech projects. And uh, so we're very happy to have them here showing wet on them. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm here with uh, our team, uh, Keith Comito and Sarah Chuka, and Narik Barshai, who is another co-founder of Genspace, sitting in the audience uh, recording. Um, so we have a, a device out that we're hopefully going to roll out on Kickstarter um, that you know, we call BioArcade, um, sometimes we call Wet Pong, uh, sometimes Biotic Games. Um, so we've got a demo here, but I want to talk a little bit about the space that we started uh, a few years ago. Um, Genspace, this community biotechnology laboratory that's um, right here in Brooklyn. So just grab, you know, the 2-3 train, 4-5 train, go, go out to a Fort Greene area and it's an open community biotech lab, one of the first of its kind in the world. Um, so it's a biohacker space. So um, a lot of you here are hackers, so are, you have workshops that you can go to and use a variety of tools and build things, build objects, usually electronic objects or code things. Um, we do things similar, but we, we, we code basically life. Um, that's what we do at the lab. So um, our focus is biotechnology and synthetic biology. So we basically have a hacker space um, with tools available to everyone to come in and use them to work on a project of their own devi devising. Um, so these are just some screenshots from the Genspace lab. We've been in operation for a, a couple of years now. So what are we approaching our third year anniversary? Fourth year anniversary? No, not five. Five? 2000. But we opened the doors in December of 2010, so, you know, to the public, yeah. So we're building up things um, uh, up until that point. Um, so you can become a member, so it's pretty, um, it's pretty low key. This is what people thought of when we first said we're going to open up a biohacker space. Um, people were like, what are you going to do there? And that's what they saw. Um, but that's not what we do. Um, so um, maybe this project eventually. Um, but we work with microbes, so basically small organisms. So we work with, um, so we have microbes on this microcontroller apparatus here. Um, we work with bacteria, we work with um, uh, protists, paramecia, we work with plants. Um, so we're a biosafety level one laboratory. So what that means is that everything that we do in a lab, you can do in a high school. It's that safety level. So all the, all the organisms we work with, um, you can essentially eat them. Nothing's going to happen to you. Um, but we do genetic engineering. So we teach, um, we have projects at the lab, at the space, where people can do genetic engineering projects. Um, and really, uh, a space like this is, has come of age at this point. So we've had electronic hacker spaces. People have been hacking things, um, you know, the proverbial garage where Steve Jobs and Wozniak built their PC back in the 70s. Um, you had to supply a source of cheap um, electronic parts that are available and you can build these you know, devices and code them relatively inexpensively and that sort of started to mature around the 70s. Um, biotech, you know, the, the kind of the, the irony about biotech, it's actually one of the oldest technologies of humankind. Um, Rob Carlson called, he's a, he's a biotechnology analyst, called biology, you know, said biology is technology. and. All the foods that we eat right now, if we go to stores and we get our heirloom tomatoes, all the organic stuff that we get, um, that doesn't, that's not natural. Um, you're not going to find a big juicy tomato out in the wild or a big corn cob that's been bred selectively um, globally for the past 10 to 12,000 years by humankind um, by basically selecting traits that you like. Um, all the animals, uh, all, the, all the plants, that's been selectively bred for traits that we, that we enjoy. And it's only until very recently and by very recently, I mean within like my lifetime practically, the you know, early 70s, that we were able to understand how to use enzymes and other little tools from nature and basically rewire the componentry, the circuits, the genetic circuits at that level and produce traits at a very more, uh, in a more defined way rather than letting random mutations just make some jackpot mutant that we like and then breeding it over millennia we can speed that up into a span of months and years rather than thousands of years. Um, and that technology is just accelerating and now it's become cheaper and cheaper and more available um, to the point that we're at a stage now that I, I kind of roughly would say that 
you know, um, the, hack, the electronic hacker revolution was in the 70s. These tools are now filtering out into laboratory spaces, unconventional spaces, uh, and allowing people to utilize them in projects that are not what you would expect when you think of biotech. When people think biotech, you, most applications you think of are biomedical applications. Certainly that was one of the first few products that hit the market was recombinant insulin. Um, but now this technology is enabling people to do things uh, with it that are outside of the field of biomedicine and applications that just you didn't even think of. And I'll go over some of these applications. Um, so this is a screenshot from our lab. This is one kind of component. There's a class taking place here. Um, I'm like the only person not wearing a lab coat. Um, it's, I just can't get used to wearing lab coats. Um, but this is the lab that we built, basically repurposed materials. Um, Alatar is the building owner, um, is a super cool guy. And um, this is all old restaurant shelving. So we essentially built this lab from scratch over a period of time and made it accessible to anybody who wants to use it. And we stocked it with equipment that we had donate, people donated, but also that we found on eBay. So I just got a screenshot of, uh, this, is, this has already been sold, it's from 2012, but a PCR machine for $99.99. Um, and this is basically, this is sort of like the heart of most molecular biolabs. It's a machine that's basically a, an amplification device for DNA. So you make millions of copies of DNA. And that's sort of the reason you need to make many copies of DNA is it's the source material for all our projects. So when you go on TV and you see a CSI episode where they identify a criminal from one hair sample, um, they can't do that unless they amplify that DNA or make millions of copies of it so they have enough to work with. So you kind of feed your stuff through this type of machine with specialized enzymes. And this stuff was worth, you know, this device here that's now 99 bucks, it was $10,000 when it first hit the market ages ago in 1995. So now, you know, the, the cost has dropped dramatically. Um, sequencing costs have dropped dramatically. When you wanted to synthesize DNA um, a long time ago, you know, eons ago in, in biotech history, five years ago, ten years ago, um, you had to do it at, in your own lab with the DNA synthesizers. So you had to, you know, hire a lab tech to work on this machine using, you know, nasty organic chemical compounds, and they'd have to, you know, know what they're doing. And it took them, you know, months and months to learn how to use it. And um, not every lab can afford it. But now there's companies that are outsourcing these um, technologies. So if you want a, a sequence of DNA made. You essentially go on your laptop, design your source code, sort of know what you're doing, so any kind of string of A's, T's, G's, and C's you want to design, and a thousand nucleotides will run you about $150. So a company will then literally FedEx it back to you, right? So a lot of this stuff is, is outsourced. So we have a lab where you can then take these components and reassemble them um, to your own devising and make a new what we call a device, but in this case a genetic device that can be uploaded into an organism um, and have it do something. So we've got students uh, coming in, student programs. We have courses, so we offer a synthetic biology course. So a couple of um, classes, um, students can basically, um, it's a workshop. You come in and you uh, design something, you build it, and a few weeks later you have your bacteria that's doing something. So all the steps are basically taught. And none of this would be possible uh, if the DNA wasn't uh, modular. Um, it, all, the, all the source code out there, um, you know, the way evolution has worked, um, it, all our sequences are modularizable. We can essentially take sections and, and, and basically um, define them in hierarchical functions and recombine them. So that's why you can take something from bacteria, copy it, and have it repurposed and work in a higher organism, or vice versa backwards. Human recombinant insulin that is identical to human proteins that is injected into humans around the world that saves them from diabetes is produced in E. coli, in big vats and big fermentation vessels, uh, using human genetic source code that's been copied in a PCR machine. So, so we teach people basically these key techniques, um, things like transformation, where you take this genetic information and then basically chemically plug it in, put it back into the bacteria. Um, so we got, this is from a Google workshop. So these are some Google engineers that are just got, I guess, tired of programming code and decided to now work with microbes. And they're shaking a Petri dish there, putting some of their DNA, not their DNA, but you could put your DNA in there if you wanted to, um, putting in another source code into the E. coli, um, streaking it out, and then later basically looking at the phenotypes. So um, this is just some samples of some projects we had going on in the lab. So, a lot of you have probably heard of GFP or green fluorescence protein. It was one of these first 
um, reporter genes that was cloned from a, a, a fluorescent jellyfish. Um, it's used very commonly in biotechnology because it's a harmless protein. It's very small. The, the source code for it is about 750 letters. So it's a very small piece of DNA to be synthesized. You could get a company to synthesize it for you for about 70 bucks. Um, or you can clone it yourself out of a jellyfish. Luciferase, which glows in the dark, that's basically a gene or a set of genes from um, a number of organisms, fireflies being one of them. Violacin, it's a number of genes that basically synthesizes a small biochemical compound that produces this purple pigment, red fluorescence protein from sea coral. So all of this stuff can be basically interconverted, exchanged from one organism to another. Um, and you can do a lot of nifty things with it. So we also have um, workshops for, for children where they get to paint with these genetically modified organisms and that looks pretty cool. Um, so, um, you know, that's, you know, and you can do really, really sophisticated things with it. So I just want to touch on a few of these applications that are happening now. Um, so, you know, insulin is one protein that happened in the 70s saving a lot of lives. Things are getting much more sophisticated where people are now wanting to take entire pathways of many genes and basically string them together and put them from one, take them from one organism like a plant and put it into something like yeast that you brew beer. So instead of fermenting, um, producing ethanol, you can produce a more complex molecule, something like artemisinic acid, which is the number one anti-malarial compound. Um, and this is a lot easier um, to get yeast to produce this grams of this in a fermentation vessel than basically having, you know, many tens of thousands of acres of this plant that you then have to harvest and then use, you know, organic solvents to extract uh, the artemisinin from the plant, so on and so forth. And artemisinic acid is relatively simple. I mean, there's plants out there that are going extinct but have life-saving compounds. So how do you prevent those plants from ba basically being clear cut, cut out of existence for a va valuable small molecule, well, you can essentially, you know, really what's valuable to the economic market is not the whole plant per se, but that pathway that's making that, that drug molecule. So by cloning that, um, you can get around that whole issue and essentially um, uh, have it produced in a fermentation vessel. So all of these technologies that we teach um, can apply to a sophisticated approach like this. Um, so that's manipulating the genetic code. Um, you can also read it. So the two go hand in hand. The technologies to read the code also go in hand, hand in hand with being able to adjust it or, re, or, or manipulate it. So um, applications of that are obviously vast. One type of application is genetic testing. Um, so I don't know here who's who's like submitted their DNA sample, spit in a tube, and send it out to 23andMe or one of these like or or um, Genographic or one of these companies that will read it for you. Wow, nobody, one person, two, three. Um, yeah, there, there's a bit of controversy with 23andMe and the FDA because you know the FDA recently ruled that you know unless you have a doctor's permission, you're not you're not qualified as a citizen to look at your own genetic sequence for for medical information. So you know that's. That was, a, that was kind of a real weird ruling, but they, they're, they're cracking down on that supposedly for the protection of the consumer. Um, but, you know, it's probably because they were charging really cheap for it, like 99 bucks. But um, we teach how to do genetic testing in the lab itself. You can, you can read your, analyze your own DNA in our lab, and it's a very straightforward approach, and we teach all the, all the methods, and we have a class where people basically come in swab their own DNA. You don't send it down anywhere. You actually do the processing in the lab itself. You extract your genomic DNA. So you've got all those billions of letters floating in a tube. You lyse the tubes. And then after you lyse the tubes and you run this PCR reaction to amplify as much DNA as you need, you look at, we're looking at a one discrete location. Here's a student loading it on a, a gel to do the analysis. And you get these, this band pattern. And this band pattern basically tells you the sizes of DNA at one particular location that's embedded in all the billions of letters of your genetic code. And this one particular workshop that we looked at um, lets you know whether or not you have a natural resistance or, or immunity to the HIV virus. So there's a small percentage of people that when they have this mutation, and these, these doublets here are people that have this mutation. Um, it's this little band here, and these are normal people. It's normal, right? Uh, this one here is, um, I think that's a doublet too. There's one, it's rare to get like just one of these. So 1% of the Northern European population has that. So that was a pretty nifty thing. So you can, you can learn how to do this and you can analyze yourself and instead of paying a big corporation $4,000 to find out whether or not you're, 
predisposed to some illness, you can do it for 40 bucks uh, in a lab and analyze it yourself. And you best of all, learn how to do it you know, from scratch and apply this, you know, your knowledge to any bit of your code and, and, and read it. And it's really grown outside the confines of um, just a few individuals. This is a snapshot from 2010. Uh, I'm for the past four years I've been mentoring a team now it's kind of filtered out into the community biotech spectrum where we're at so um, Dr. Ellen Jorgensen who's also a co-founder and the executive director of Genspace she's running a team out of Genspace uh, where we have a group of individuals um, participating in a competition going on now for the 10th anniversary called iGEM International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition it's basically like a biotech boot camp for students. It started for at colleges and now it's um, high school students and essentially all, it happens all through summer and people make te get teams together and they try to build some kind of object using genetic engineering. Kind of like you would get together have a competition to code something and come up with like some kind of awesome code or some sort of electronic gadget or robot at the end of two three months. In this case it would be a new life form. So um, and there's quite a few successful teams out there so this is just one, two slides I have of a project we did in 2010 with the Harvard iGEM team. This was, we called it the iGarden. This was basically a box. All the components are real. They, they're just in freezers. We never asked the USDA for permission to sell this. But it would give basically the, the capabilities for small farmers to compete with Monsanto, for example. So they could produce their own genetically engineered crops and then raise a whole bunch of other social and philosophical and legal issues, right? So that, that's one cool thing about iGEM is that you get to raise all these issues and, and really confront people with it because this is now entering the market in directions that um, are not just biomedical, but um, biomaterials, for example. Um, new types of materials that are produced from genetically engineered microbes, um, new types of biopolymers, um, having microbes produce nylon, for example. Um, who knows, maybe, you know, a bamboo that that's incorporates spider silk um, proteins that has higher tensile strength. So applications that you normally don't think of when you think of biotech. Um, so we'll, we'll be seeing more of these types of applications and products hitting the market. And I think the more people that are aware of it and know how this technology is applied, so you could make rational decisions rather than have a knee-jerk reaction that this is all bad or all good. You know, all technology, I think it's obvious to most people here that tech savvy has, is a double-edged sword dual purpose, we've all heard these terms, um, but biotech so far has done, you know, um, it's not just my opinion, but more, more good than harm, and, you know, if you want to believe it or not believe it, at least have, you know, at least know how the technology is being used and applied, and you can come in and actually do it yourself hands-on and, and see what it's all about. Um, so that's basically what that's, our space is, 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 is all about, so you can then become a member and just come in and, and use the facility. Um, that kind of leads into this project that we have here. Uh, this was an I, this we were inspired by a, a lab over at Caltech, um, Ingmar Riedel Cruz. He's a physicist, and he was working on something called biotic games. And this is actually an old observation. I wanted to find out well, when was this noticed that Paramecia, basically little critters that live in pond water, uh, respond to electric fields? And there's a, I think the earliest paper I found was from 1890. Uh, and there are a couple more in the 1940s, but it was an observation. Then all the, then now, um, people were like, "Well, can we play a game with this stuff?" So um, it turns out that that you can. Um, you can have microbes essentially um, respond to polarity gradients. So what we have here is essentially an electric field, and we wanted to have a project that can incorporate all both biology. Um, and programming and also electronics all at once because at Genspace all of our projects tend to focus on really you know biotech heavy um, and we have a lot of people coming into our space that have a s stronger background in programming and electronics coming from that community that's more mature and that kind of hacker space so this is a cool project in that we can incorporate kind of the strengths of people coming from many different directions and sort of focus on one project um, so taking a cue from um, Dr. Cruz's lab, we basically wanted to have an open source version of this. So this has gone through some iterations over, I was shocked that our workshop was in 2012. <laughs> I thought it was like, yeah, we must have done this like six months ago. And I was like, well, wait, it's been two years. Um, and this was our first iteration. It was a workshop talk by Gava Patz, who's uh, an engineer, an electrical engineer. And um, Ellen Jorgensen invited him and we, they brainstormed a project where they can essentially take a webcam and um, an Arduino 
and code it. And essentially this little platform here, it's laser cut and with pencil leads as, as electrodes and build a little platform where you can put your microbes and focus on it and then essentially alter the polarity of this grid and have all the microbes swarm towards the negative, right? So that's all that was happening is that they were just swarming towards the negative gradient. Um, and that's uh, Gabe Apatz giving a, giving a talk. So this is our space, gen space. So everybody's here hunkered over, um, soldering their boards together and making their device. And that's the lab, the, the glass lab you saw earlier in the background. So really have a mixed use facility here. Uh, and if you really want to find out th how this early iteration was done, you can go to making.do paramecium, um, where there's uh, um, online, basically, instructions on how to make this. And uh, Gava talks more about all sorts of other interfaces you can hook up with, the, with this paramecium game. I think he made a mind control version of this as well. So instead of a joystick, you can hook up one of those, um, I don't know what you call it. Uh, like emotive headset. Emotive headset, right. And then you could train yourself to regulate the polarity and use your mind to control the microbes. Um, so this has been going through several iterations. And um, this is the, the last iteration we had, Maker Faire UK. And now we've moved on to um, hooking it up to an Arduino. And Keith here, um, so Sarah coded the Arduino. And Keith, uh, who's an app developer, um, designed this kind of really a system with own custom music theme to it as well. Um, this is us at the World Science Festival. Here's somebody really intrigued by what's going on on the screen. Um, and they're controlling, uh, she's controlling basically the microbes. And this is the kind of screenshot from the Paramecia Arcade. Keith, I think you have the high score for now. Uh, and this is our latest iteration, which we're going to do a demo of. So basically, um, instead of just looking at the Paramecia all bare naked swimming around, we have an overlay here, some tracking software that Keith would be happy to tell you all the technical nitty gritty behind. Of. Um, basically converts them into these white blobs that swim around on your, on your iPhone, so it's an iOS application. And overlaid is an augmented reality screen for the Paramecia with these little rings, which you can code to be anything. And they're just like a, a real life Pac-Man. They'll swim through the centers of these rings. And when they take up a certain ratio or volume of that, of that center, um, that ring is gobbled up by the Paramecia. And you have a certain time limit in which to do this game. Uh, so that's, that's, basically, um, that's basically the Wetpong Bio Arcade um, version one. And we'll probably come up with some other game versions as, as time rolls on and as we kind of try to push it out into, into Kickstarter land and uh, get, get everybody interested. Um, so that's, that's the box I designed. <laughs> so points to anybody who can tell which, where, which game I lifted this off of and what the... Zaxxon, exactly. <laughs> Zaxxon font. Um, <laughs> So thank you very much. And that's my talk. And we have a, a, a demo here of the game. And Narit? Yeah, we're going to show it with the camera. So um, how, do, how do we do it? Turn this on? No. Yeah. No. Uh, how do I do this? Um, all right, I'll turn your phone on. 4444. Four, four, four. Uh, I don't know how to switch the camera. Um, oh, switch the browser? Is it this one? Oh, here it is. All right, awesome. So let me see. So let me get out of here. Let me go to the original. Oops, I was right next to the camera. See if the critters are still here. No, got to put some. So we'll make a little artificial pond here. So that's the that's where they live right here, and the iPhone is on this big heat sink. And thank you. And now you can get these paramecia from a pond, but you can also get it ordered from Carolina Biological. So they're pretty safe. If you ever do dove into a pond and swallowed a bunch of water, you just ate tens of millions of paramecia. Um, so they're pretty much everywhere. They're ubiquitous. So let's see if we can see some of these. So there's a kernel in here where they like to nibble on. So if you kind of go around there, it's, it's like their hangout. Let's see if we pick, oh, there they go. So you can see them swimming around. All these little things that look like grains of rice are paramecia. And let's see if this is, oops, I got to plug this in. So I got to hook this up to power up the Arduino. 
and get a current going in there. Um, perhaps, let's see if this, so I think the power is on, yeah. So let's see if they go. So they're going in one direction. And let's see if they'll turn around. So now they're turning around. OK, guys, go back in the other direction. There you go. Back in the other direction. Back and forth. Now go right. OK, go up. All right. Now go back. OK, they're going towards me. All right. So it's like a stampede of paramecia. So they're all basically just reacting to this negative polarity. And then when we hit this, we can do a game overlay. Loading paramecium goodness. Uh, there they go. <laughs> so when they run, run, run through the center of the ring, it gets picked up. There they go. So now we can basically, if we hold down the controller, we should get them hurting in different directions. Let's have them go down. Good. Let's have them go up. All right. Back. Turn around. All right. So you can, you can kind of try to swarm them around in a circle. Um, there they go. <laughs> yep. All right, go up. All right, this way, back again. See how fast I can, if I can beat your score, Keith. Uh, uh. I think you've already lost. Oh, all right. Okay, back again. So there's, you can learn some tactics. You can get them to just kind of spiral around. There they go. Come on, a few more. One more. Come on. Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah. Ah. There you go. All right, one minute. In. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So that's the game, and I think we'll have another, what, half hour of gameplay still out there. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Over the table and please sign up on our mailing list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, any questions? Please shoot me some questions. Um, Anybody have any questions about sociological either? questions to technical coding questions? Yeah. <laughs> anything in between? Anyone want to know how the motion detection works? No? <laughs> um, so actually, that's probably the key component of the, that made the app challenging is that to typically do what that, what uh, picking up on the motion of all the paramecium is known as multiple blob detection, which is basically trying to get the center of every moving organism and keep track of them all at the same time, which is very computationally expensive, especially to do on a mobile device. So when we first tried to do this, it was like, you know, one frame per second, which was totally not doable. So we ended up coming up with an interesting kind of workaround. So what's really going on there is the first thing that's happening, um, you saw the raw, th uh, the raw feed when uh, Oliver was showing you just under the microscope what it looked like, right? So from there, we ran what's known as a high pass filter, which basically only anything that's moving quickly is still there and everything else becomes black. But then there's not really too much to see. So then we applied a luminance filter after that, which then takes anything that remains and makes it white. So that's kind of what you're seeing there, those white blobs. But the way we actually do the hit detection, which was the kind of key innovation that we needed to do to make this work at a reasonable frame rate, is although you don't see it, what's really going on behind the scenes is I'm using a pixelation filter to kind of turn it into like, you know, Nintendo style. So making boxes, pixels, that are the same size as the rings. So after all those filters, if there's paramecium in a particular box, it's white, and if not, it's black. So then all I have to do is, is the box white? Then collect the ring. If not, leave it alone. So that's how basically the motion detection is able to work at like 60 frames per second, which is what we needed to do there. Anybody have any questions about that or anything else? And you do need a heat sink because those iPhones get really warm. Yeah, after. especially on a hot summer day. What is the Kickstarter so we're still working on that, but it's going to incorporate an app that's available. And it's, um, 
the really the customizable component is the is the housing, the chamber the, that that uh, can regulate the paramecia. Everything else, you know, the Arduino uh, can be you know uh, externally supplied by by uh, whoever uh, purchases it. But really, the core is the the control surface where the paramecia live. So that needs to be you know right now it's, it it works, but to make it really kind of robust and um, you know, uh, plug and play. Um, that's something that we still need to, to work on. So it uh, is really super reliable, and, and people could use it repeatedly. Yeah. So it would be, be the app and the paramecium, and then the microscope. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one kind of modification that you know maybe it would be like a stretch goal or something. Like what would be really awesome to do is, I'm not sure if any, how many of you people would remember things in the '80s, but they used to have these little like customized little arcade mini machines for like Frogger and Qbert and that kind of stuff. So it would be really nice to make sort of like a custom housing where a mobile device would just kind of slot into it and maybe make different, like right, right now the stage is just one flat thing the paramecium is swimming in. But you could sort of conceive of sort of specially engineered, you know, microfluidics channels to make sort of different games, you know, like if it was kind of like this, the overlay could be kind of like Donkey Kong or something like that. So you kind of make this console where you can slot in different cartridges and play different like biological games. Maybe two player games. That would be cool too. So, so don't the paramecium either die out or multiply and just Yeah, they do. They, yeah, well, um, <laughs> well they, they, they won't to totally take over the world because they're in a little jar there. Um, but uh, they, yeah, I mean, they, you, can, you have to take care of them. There are a lot, you can buy a vial for $7 and there's like a little uh, wheat kernel here that they, that they eat on. So, you know, it's like you have, to, you have to take care of them, right? It's like you can't leave them out on a sunny shelf and forget about them. Uh, if you make a commercial game, how are people going to pay Yeah, that's a good question. And, and we got them from a vendor, Carolina Biologicals. You could you know, go out to Central Park and scoop up some pond water, and you'll have t tons of paramecia. If you don't want to do that, you can go to Carolina Biologicals, and for $7, they'll give you a jar that you can essentially feed yourself and maintain in water and a little bit of rice grains for in perpetuity, because they'll just divide and divide and divide. As long as you don't forget to feed them, um, you know, they'll, they'll just keep living. So we were thinking about offering like a, like a, like a voucher that uh, you purchase the game, and you can get uh, your sample shipped to you when you're ready from Carolina and have your jar of paramecia. Game and a pet. Yeah, exactly. On that point, another thing to kind of think about, like I'm not sure how feasible it would be to do, but if you could almost kind of make this thing kind of like half a aquarium, half biological system, where basically like a bioreactor, where they would constantly, you know, have food in there and they would just live and reproduce like kind of forever, and then you just have a channel that kind of lets some in. Let some out, you That's know. like the PlayStation 4 version. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I think we have to, one more question we have to wrap up because the other speakers can put. What voltage are you using the pulse width calculation? Five volts? Yeah, five volts, whatever yeah. is coming out of the Arduino. So yeah, they're, they're, they'll respond down to like three volts. So very, very small voltage. Yeah. If Thank you. If you do have more questions, these guys will still be sitting up outside uh, for the last uh, remaining time. So if you want to come by and see them, by all means, please do. Thanks. So thank, thank you. you.
So for our last presenters today, um, Zach and Momo have, have brought with them uh, the Google Talking Shoe. Um, these two I always expect surprises from, and always good ones, so I don't even know exactly what this is, but when I saw them sign up, I was like, this will be good. Um, so I'm dying to see what exactly it is. Uh, I'll leave you with that ambiguous beginning and let you take it from there. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we have a company called Yes, Yes, No, and there are three of us. Two people always say yes, and one person says no, like all the time, and that's where the name of our company comes from. Yeah, um, it's a, uh, I do electronic development. I come from a documentary film background. Marcella, she come up, she's an architect, but we use her for everything, almost like hardware related. And that does software, mostly. And we're an interactive agency, and when you say the word interactive, people think of clicking and mouse and, and so on. And we're really trying to do uh, you know, new strange things. This is what our studio looks like. It's usually a mess, like a disaster. Um, and we're, we're, we're trying to do things with, uh, with software um, you know, to make things that are interactive, that understand the body, that understand gesture, that understand movement and amplify it and create something magical. And, uh, and also do things with hardware and build kind of <coughs> custom, unique hardware for creating uh, strange experiences for people. Yeah, I would say we, the purpose of our projects, hi Carla. Yeah. The purpose of, of uh, most of our projects, we want to make projects and we want to make projects that make people happy. And Arduino kind of become a tool for us to be able to do things like that. Um, let's start with he want to say <laughs> this is like a normal day in a the studio? A normal day, like we're... Just an R2-D2 laying around? Our neighbors... I would say it's more like a month without sleep. That's yeah. where the R2-D2 comes from. Marcella 3D printed all the pieces with two MakerBots running at the same time, I think. So we're going to talk about three projects. We'll end with the Google Shoe, and we'll go really quickly. The first one is called Connecting Lights, and this is a project for the Olympics that was along Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall is... The, in England, it's the border of the Roman Empire, and it goes across the country. It's a really narrow part of England, but we set up weather balloons that light up and talk to each other across the countryside. So here you can see the wall. And actually, the wall really doesn't exist anymore. It's more like an idea of the wall. And we set up these balloons on, on really kind of, you know, sort of insane geography. Um, and we used Arduino to help us prototype um, this, this animation, and the balloons communicate through uh, radio. And so they send signals, really pulses of light across the landscape. It's like 80 miles. Right. How many were there? There were about 300. Our goal was 500 where the balloons light up at nighttime and talk to each other. We were able to set up 300 because the weather was kind of extreme. But Arduino had been pretty reliable this whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, Bob. Where did this project come from? Um, it was part of the Olympics. They have a cultural Olympiad going on the same time as the Olympics, where they commission the ar the, sorry, the London 2012 Olympics. <laughs> so they commission artists to create you know, projects outside of London so that people that are coming to the games would go and see other parts of the country and, and you know, maybe travel, just you know, see something besides London. Yeah. So yes, yes, bot. You want to talk about? It? It's a it's a robot that goes around and gives away candies. So at the Rome Maker Fair, Intel has launching their product, the Galileo, the Intel Galileo, and they invited us to build something for the Galileo. And we're like, hey, let's mm -hmm. make a robot that gives candies away for kids. And and the Galileo is one one of a kind of new products that we think are interesting, which is combining an Arduino and a Linux 
computer in one. So it's, it's actually like a full Linux stack. So you can, you can run Arduino code, but you can also SSH in and talk to the device and you know, have like a web server on it and stuff like that. So we were running the robot as a web server. We connect the web server via like a, a web page on our phone and then we're able to control the robot, dispense candies and move around the Maker Faire in Rome. So it was this is my favorite. There's four buttons for movement, and then there's a candy button, which is really important, <laughs> and a speaker. And then this is the CEO of Intel. I don't know if you knew what to expect when the robot met him on stage. When the robot was on stage, um, I, had, I didn't have time to fix it, so it only turns one way. And it has to like go through the stage and turn to where Massimo and the CEO was. So it has to always spin 360 degree before it moves forward. It was a really nice moment. It yeah. was like dancing. <laughs> and we also it would, to get at Maker Faire. Obviously, it was swarmed by um, swarmed by kids. Yeah, Kid, kids are fun. And um, we also brought the project back to New York. And then we went to Halloween, went to a classroom where kids are. They all sit very nicely waiting for the candy. And then we brought it to a Halloween party, which is really crazy because there is like hundreds of kids like every 10 minutes and everybody is like, it gives away candy. So they like all go towards the robot. And I was the only one there. <laughs> and the parents was also yelling at me because they're like, why don't you give my kids some candies? And I was like, the candy was like giving out in the first 30 minutes. So it was like very stressful moment, but and it was really fun. That's what's inside. It's so it looks really like slick on the outside, but of course the inside is like. It was as, awesome. It was it like <laughs> water bottle, yeah. 3D printed piece that doesn't really work so well, but it works throughout like the whole month. Yeah. And the wiring was like, it's okay. Yeah. Um, the last project is the talking shoes that we were uh, approached by Google to make some sort of strange, um, strange object for South by Southwest uh, that you would wear, <laughs> and we suggested this idea of creating talking shoes. And they're like connected objects that you can that interacts with you and knows what you're doing and kind of give you feedbacks. So this is some of our initial early prototype. Um, I love it. It looks terrible. It broke every time you wore it. Yeah, I like have to tape it down. And recently I saw this picture. This is like the initial prototype of the iPhone with all these pieces, like a f actually like a phone on the table and all of these pieces. And I sort of like it. It's like always the pro initial prototype sort of looks like this. Yeah. And then we kind of slim it down a little bit till the end and like we had to take apart a lot of shoes to be able to do that. And we prototyped the, the sensor pad. It's like a shoe insert with papers, and we just taped out everything. So we got very serious about thinking of, about the sensors. Like, how could you actually <laughs> sense the movement of the feet? So we have FSR sensors in the shoe, embedded in the sole of the shoe. Three, three sensors that could actually tell you different things, like if you were jumping or what part of the shoe you were landing on, um, as well as accelerometer and... Can I show them the first prototype? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so the first, we did a first prototype that is like a strap that you strap onto your shoes. And then there is just one sensor in the back, and we kind of know if you're tapping, like tapping your feet, like if you're moving fast. And uh, there's only one feet. And then we get to, we got invited to do the second version. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but but then the second version was like, let's do two shoes and six sensors with like a accelerometer, like everything that's inside iPhone that's put inside shoes. So we prototype with Arduino first, and then we move on to building our own board using Arduinos, and we're using like some XBs. And the, this is not China, this is in Brooklyn. <laughs> 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 the studio looked like two MakerBots and a bunch of hardware and like fabrics. Yeah. And then we, we were- Asian and South Americans working very hard. <laughs> um, and then in addition to just making all this stuff, we did a lot of testing. So we li literally like all we were doing is running and jumping and a lot of stuff like this. <laughs> this is the one I was outside. Did you say? Skinny jeans must have been chapping. <laughs> I like listening to industrial music while I run. <laughs> 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 
So this is before it had personality. <laughs> then we set it up at South by Southwest and um, had a bunch of uh, versions for people to try and kind of run around with the shoe. Um, when we've gone through different iterations, this is the sort of second iteration is actually pairs of shoes. Because um, that was on our way to friends went to Con Media Festival, and I literally have like a suitcase full of shoes at Tog. Google has unveiled a talking shoe that comments on your running performance. Which did I tell my friends about this? So this is some kind of PR video, but you can actually see like there's a nice nice part where you can see our development. From off the shelf components that anyone has access to. The project gave a sneaker a voice and a direct line to the web. I'm sorry, am I interrupting you? Using a series of sensors, an onboard speaker, and a mobile phone, the sneaker comments on everything the wearer does in real time. It nudges them. This is super boring. Motivates them. <laughs> That's more like it. Gets them in the game. Call 911 because you're on fire. It pushes content to their Google Plus feed so friends can listen in and reply. Breaks over. And it can post directly to dynamic banners engaging the entire web. The talking shoe debuted at the Google Playground during South so it was really fun, like when you make this thing, but also actually setting it up and letting people try it and giving them a kind of um, a means to, you know, not just making an object, but wear it and test it. This is hysterical to me, but it's also really kind of cool. Top ten things you don't want to hear from your speakers. So, so I, we're. We'll end with this. This is my, my, my favorite picture, our favorite pictures of this project. This is actually the airport security guard. You know, we are trying to travel with these shoes, and you can imagine how weird they look. Like every time we get stopped, or we think we're going to get stopped in the airport with these, you know, it's like crazy to have a shoe that has electronics in it, and they always pull it out, and they always want a demo. And there's something like, I love creating, ma like you create magic for people, we created magic at South by Southwest, but we also created magic for this security guard um, for, for his day, and like it, it's really wonderful. Yeah, he was really happy when he saw the shoes. Yeah. Um, and so all, <laughs> all of these projects are, are about creating magic, and with all of them, we've been you know, deeply, um, I would say blessed to be able to use Arduino and prototype really quickly and build you know, weird experimental hardware for uh, people to enjoy themselves. Yeah, I, well, I, I got some questions earlier about where art is and how do we work with companies like Google or Intel to build projects that's kind of not their everyday project. But I would say it was just because really we're able to use these tools and prototype things really quickly and develop new, work with technology and always de kind of develop new technology to work with us is a really good thing. Thank you. Any any questions? Or th yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> um, I brought some also some stuff that we work with, so you feel free to come up and play with them. Any questions about these projects? Yeah, what well, no, we don't sell them. Mm -hmm. I would love to sell them, um, but no, we don't sell them. They're more um, the, the Yes Yes Buy is going to be kind of touring a little bit in April. I think the first day in April is uh, the Brick Media Center. And in the beginning of April, if you just look on their website, we're going to bring the robot there and kind of give away candies again. <laughs> Did you need an argument for each shoe? Um, yes. So for what we're doing for... Um, these shoes are communicating to each other over radio and then communicating to a phone over Bluetooth. And so we, we do use Arduino in both shoes. And then we, we do. We use File first and then we move on to Teensy. But we always prototype with Arduinos. But you need one for each Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What do you do for batteries? We use those small LiPo batteries. Yeah. They're in the sole. Our system is on three points. They're in, three like, points. the high tops are really good because the sole is sort of thick, and it's, like, a perfect place for a battery. So um, so how much did they cost? How much did they cost? Did, they, uh, did anybody laugh <laughs> that? Yeah, yes. Yes, that. Um, I would, um, it's really hard to say, but all these things are kind of, you can find in, like, you know, like a maker shelf kind of yeah nothing store. 
nothing in here is really fancy. So we're so, using like $20 or, you know, we're using Teensy's like a $20 board or $20 or $30 board. The first prototype, yeah. we used the Bluetooth module, SD card from Sparkfun. So you can yeah. kind of know if you go on the website, find these parts, you know how much they cost. Say like a couple, maybe a couple hundred bucks. I'm not sure. But, yeah. Google commissioned you guys to make this product? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I see. So did they, are those custom shoes like from Google? Or? No, they just like, they, they had some sort of uh, partnership with Adidas. So we just kept going to the, got, getting the shoes at Adidas. We have some branding on the shoes, but it's not like specially made for this project. And we became the favorite customers of this. There's an Adidas store in Soho. <laughs> and we would come and we would have like the SKU numbers. And we'd come in and be like, we, we, with I this want like. 20 pair of those. Like, no. <laughs> Nobody comes in and orders that many shoes, so we were we were really well known over there. So, yeah. 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 yeah, we just put labels. Why did you get by using two shoes instead of one? Like, what was the main thing? I mean, one of the difficult things is detecting jumps. So you could detect it. You know, with one shoe, it could be like, you know, if you really move upward, if you have a lot of acceleration. And you're um, and you're off the ground for a long time. Then we would assume that that's a jump, but it was really hard to tell. And there were a lot of ways to get false jumps with with one with one shoe. But with two shoes, you could actually really know when your feet are off the ground. And um, it was helpful for detecting things like spinning and kicking and things like actions that are hard to perceive with one shoe, but if you have two shoes, you know that one is stationary and the other is doing something. So we were able to improve the logic. I think at first we wanted to know if we're sitting on the couch and have one leg up on the table and the other leg was like on the floor. So that was like the beginning. They want to know this kind of scenario and what to respond with them. Because the shoes have characters. There's like five characters related to the shoes and you, you'll be able to choose from the phone app. So you can choose like who's going to talk to you and what kind of things they're going to say to you. Like there's a Williamsburg hipster character. It's always very sarcastic. Sure. Yeah, she's, she's always like, talking. She's like, she doesn't, she doesn't talk nice. And there's yeah. a British, there's a guy with British accent. Yeah. Is it, a, is it an open source project? Um, yeah. um th this one? I mean, Do I we think, put all the, co yeah. I think everything is on GitHub, so. Um, we just need to organize them a little bit. But yeah, actually, like, <laughs> I a, 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 yeah, I think all of these projects are on on GitHub. So yeah. yeah. Did you need any uh, like your heat sinks? How much weight did it add to the shoe? Uh, we don't need heat sink because there's nothing really. It's on. It's running on three volts, oh, okay. and all the sensor mm. they're very like they cost so very the, minimum. Yeah, yeah, we had like a IMU unit in. So I don't know if any of these are made made up. Um, you can see here actually, this is like the what the sole looks like. There's three FSRs, and then there's here. This is an IMU unit that um, is getting acceleration and gyro and stuff like that. So yeah. So how much power did it drop? It's like milliamps. <coughs> it's not a lot. It's like no more than one amp. Yeah, but actually it's really crazy because there's all these, these like conditions with shoes and electronics because your foot is sweating and you have like, there's a lot of like funky stuff that's happening in your shoe that it's really a, like a weird engineering challenge to, like one is build wear things that you're wearing because you're constantly like, there's a lot of weight on these, on these sensors, but also like there's so many funky things happening in your shoe, you know, like sweat and you know. Oh, I mean, like, uh, how does that impact? Um, oh, so we were launching at Cannes in France, where it's actually really hot there. And for some reason, like, I don't know, it's like one of those Google Glass thing where our shoes, is si the size is almost for guys. So it's not a lot of girls' size in the shoes. We have, like, from, like, maybe size 5 men to size four, 14. Is that go up there? So when we're testing, a lot of guys like wearing them and like just everybody just sweat a lot. And we were like almost fixing all the time. And then we realized actually they don't do very well with moisture. So what really impact them is the electronic gets wet. They didn't get so much protection. 
they got wet and then they stopped working for a little bit. Yeah, so for example, for a commercial iteration, we'd really think about how to laminate this and like make some replaceable unit for going, because this is like, you're putting a lot, when you start jumping on this thing, you're putting a lot of pressure on it. It worked yeah. for these demos, but so, if you want to make a product, that's one reason why it's not for sale, is that there's a lot of stu stuff still to figure out. So. It's, yeah, it's a working prototype, but mm -hmm. so we, because we have to do the shoes very quickly, so we build these little 3D printed piece that put, holds everything in place. And we got to go to MakerBot that help us, the factory help us, and it gives us like tons of colors. It just everything yeah. comes in color. It looks so pretty. Yeah. We don't get to do them on every shoe, but they're, it's really nice. The peas are up here if you want to take a look. And so these are the sensors that go inside. They're very sensitive. They can measure up to 100 pounds. Yeah, we really like them. Sorry, what? Yeah, n normal FSRs are not good for like so much weight. Like typical. No, it just it just weight. Yeah. yeah, they just have higher. They're rated for more weight. Is there a turn off button or is it only through the phone? Um, there's yeah. a turn. There's an on off switch on them because it's it's sometimes it's like super annoying because we had like these like kind of fancy you know Google execs walking around with them and they like they need to turn their shoe off because. They, they have a me they have around. a meeting or something, and the shoe just keeps talking back to them. And when they start standing still, the shoe actually is like goes a little bit, gets more tough with them, and it's like, come on already, like you know, breaks over, and they just like it gets more uh, challenging. So, Some of them got yeah. really mean when yeah. you're not moving. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks so much.